Kushi Manani, the organizer of Cakeology. As you're all aware that this year, we have had to cancel our show, unfortunately. So this is the next best thing we could do for all our baker friends and this baking community. So I hope you enjoy the rest of this evening. I would personally like to thank all our partners who have supported us through this event. I will be now sharing some of the snippets of one of the most exciting journeys I have ever undertaken and the momentum that the show has gained since its inception. Thank you. who are joining us to give you their special tips and tricks. Pay attention. Hello, hello, hello. I hope you're enjoying the day with us. We're having a great time and it's so nice to have you with us. And look who I've got to share with you. It's amazing. Judges for the Cakeology online competition. Say hi, guys. Hello. Hi, everybody. Oh, look, I'm just so excited. Nick, say hi. Head judge Nick Lodge 
don't be fooled, he's wearing black. I don't get that. Anybody who knows our head dog Nick knows he's only ever seen in green. So you're looking, you're looking very different today, Nick. Any reason? Because I'm wearing black. So. Yeah. <laughs> black is the new green. Uh, Vicky Tether, yeah. say hi, Vicky. Hello, Vicky. I tell you. <laughs> There's always one, isn't there? I take it in London, Nikki. So, so Nick in America, um, Nikki in London. We've got Barbie from Italy. I'm using my hands, Barbie. Obviously, Barbie, say hi. Dawn yeah. Butler. Are you in Nottingham at the moment, Dawn? I am in my home in Nottingham at the moment. Hello. Queen of the airbrush and also of cake frame as well. It's getting hard to describe you, Dawn. There's so many yeah. strings to your bow. That was a Robin Hood. Nottingham reference. Oh, you see that? You see that? Uh, Prachi Debelder from India. In India at the moment, Prachi. And Rosie Mazunda, editor of Cake Masters magazine. Of course, uh, you know all of this. And we are going to ask some questions, guys, just to give people a little idea of um, what you should be looking for in the competition. So some general competition questions. So I start with the head judge, Nick, Nicholas Lodge. Um, what do you feel about cake competitions in general? Well, I think cake competitions are important in our industry because that's where people learn and obviously improve their skills and uh, obviously become a better cake artist through that. So a competition is a very important part of, of anybody's skill set and obviously um, experience. And Rosie, Rosie Mazumda, editor of Cake Masters magazine, you've judged loads of competitions. Um, what are your thoughts on the reasons for entering cake competitions? I think people who make cakes for a living have to make cakes based on customers' um, orders and what they want. I think for a competition, you can get to choose what you want to make. So you can be as creative as, as you want. If there's ever been that wedding cake that you think can push your abilities a little bit, you can make it and actually put it into a competition. Um, I think competitions just really allow you to be creative, allow you to perfect a technique that maybe you've not done so many so much on orders before. So um, a really good opportunity for you to be really creative. Um, well, Dawn, Dawn Butler, you have not only entered competitions, you've won them um, entirely. So what are your thoughts on what attitude you should have towards entering competitions? You know, Rose, your attitude defines you. It defines you as a person. Um, I think it's just so important to remember that you're not actually in competition with anybody else, that you're actually in competition with yourself. And I remember entering competitions and thinking, how do I achieve this? Or how do I get better? And looking at those winners and thinking, I could never do that in a million years. But pushing myself, pushing what I could do, pushing what I could achieve, and most importantly, being open to criticism, being open to the judge's subjective views on your cake and learning how to improve yourself meant that I eventually took home best in show. So it's available to absolutely everybody, but just think about how your attitude is perceived by others and just be open and just you're improving yourself. Uh, and Prachi, your thoughts on your, the attitude you should have towards competitions and other participants as well? Uh, I think uh, participation is the most important thing. Uh, whether you win or not, um, I think uh, one thing is for sure that you gain knowledge and feedback. Uh, and no matter the result, uh, I mean, you should always give yourself a pat on the back for participating and uh, always being proud uh, of your work. But I think at the same time, it's important to uh, be open to constructive uh, feedback and allow room for um, improvement and also being kind and uh, considerate uh, to your fellow competitors who are um, in the competition for the same reason. So, you know, uh, congratulating the winners and uh, encouraging them, them to enjoy their moment of glory. I think, yeah, it's, it's really important. The, the truth is anyone who's entered a competition knows that sometimes hours, days, sometimes months have gone into the work involved, haven't they? So, and that, mm -hmm. that goes for so many participants. So it's helpful to be mindful of how long people have taken to do their work. Um, let me ask Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Ciao, Barbie. Ciao, Morty. Um, some people believe that if you do more techniques on a cake, then it's going to get you better points. Is that true or not? 
Um, the correct answer is both, yes and, and no. Yes, because the more techniques you use, I think that the better your chances. And if these techniques are innovative, that really is the icing on the cake. All in all, uh, the design needs to be, to be um, nice together and seamlessly and beautifully, you know, like to catch our, our eyes, to catch the judge's eyes. But you also should be um, happy and following your heart on what you are doing. So I am agree with all the things that the judges say. Yeah, everything. And Vicky, you often do lots of detail. You do lots of little things. Is it the case that people are going to get penalised if they don't do that detail? Or are tools that they use important? How do you, how do you look at a piece when you're judging it? I think it's important to show skills that you're good at for a start. So if you're really good at doing little tiny things, then go for it. But some people like say Dawn and yourself are really good at doing like really big displays. Um, but you should also look at things um, and make sure you're making as much of the cake as possible. So you've got um, the lace mats, molds, um, all of the little bits and pieces that make our lives easier for customer cakes but you really want to show your own skills in a competition. So if you can make lace by hand, by piping, then do so. Um, you're going to get more points for that and it's going to be more favourable in the judge's eye. Um, I'm going to finish with our head judge, the wonderful Nick Lodge, who is a, a real friend of Cakeology. Um, if you could give some advice about the judging process, because a lot of people have to remember that judging is subjective so to a certain extent it, it you, your opinion matters so how will you um be judging and what's your advice to people well first of all i think people think we have a very glamorous fun job and so it does have obviously the camaraderie of being together but we do um it's a very tedious job i mean we obviously spend hours and hours going through every tiny little detail on a cake or a flower or a cookie or whatever to make sure that obviously we're we're first of all judging fairly that's a very important part of this process um, and uh, but uh, ultimately you know it's it's uh, when entering a competition you know we have to judge it at that level because cakeology is a sort of an international competition arena and we have to judge this in the same criteria as any other international competition so it's uh, the you know as Barbara and several other people said, it's all about the details being cohesive, obviously reading the rules properly, um, and understanding what you're entering, but also being um, you know having a world class team of judges as we have means that you're getting judged by the best there is, and uh, also being able to take the criticism of the judges, being able to sort of take what they say. And don't be offended by things, but grow with those things. I mean, we do this to be to make you a better artist. And ultimately, um, I always tell my students, it's not about winning, it's about the journey. So this is all about your self-motivation, self-improvement to become a better, stronger baker or artist at the end of the day. Oh, do you know, yeah. we've all entered competitions. We all know it's, it's quite stressful and it, you really care when you've spent that much time. So we would all wish you, I, I know you'll all join me judges, wishing yeah. you good luck in the Cakeology online competition. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all next year. See you guys. Bye, Bye everybody. <laughs> Bye. Good luck. Well, a big thank you to our amazing international judges all their secrets just for you but now we've got a really special feature for the first time we are bringing to you cakeology baked laughs with award-winning comedian nitin mirani let's see if he can break a smile on those serious judges faces but first before we go there we're going to have a quick look at our lucky draw if you have registered for the show in advance you stand to win a prize Let's have a look at our draw. Let's see if we can find someone to win our amazing prizes. Let's spin that wheel. Ah, Minal Kedeka, you are our winner. Ray
raise your hand, announce yourself, you've got all our prizes for this spin the wheel. Mina, well done. <laughs> All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to this very, very special. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Vicky. We, first of all, let's let's start with doing this. Let's start <laughs> like we're campaigning for being the next president. Come on, everyone. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So, of course, today we have uh, uh, as part of the backbone. Uh, they're the backbone of the Cakeology Fest. And of course, they are what they call the judges. Uh, these are the people everybody's scared of. Uh, personally, I, I don't feel threatened at all. Uh, but then again, I can't bake anything to save my life. So that's okay. Uh, because uh, the organizers actually called me one year before and says and said, don't take part. So uh, yes, I'm, I'm one of those people. So so let me introduce myself as well. First of all, let's give you all guys a round of applause. Thank you so much for being here absolutely uh, my name is Nitin Mirani uh, I am an Indian uh, I, I grew up in Dubai because I get to travel a lot I get to meet a lot of people and uh, I think to be very honest the reason why I checked is because I think that the English accent is one of the best accents in the world uh, you know I really enjoy uh, you know like for example I have a bit of an accent which I picked up I think it's a bit more cockney uh, I don't know where it came from I've, I've not lived in England ever uh, but then again, I'm a comedian, so I'm going to fake it till, till I make it. Um, so I think the British accent, I remember, uh, this is a true story. I performed in, uh, in, uh, at, the, at the festival in Edinburgh, uh, the French festival. And I had this very nice uh, elderly British man come up to me, very cockney. He goes, uh, hello, Nitin. Mate. Listen, oh, I have a question for you. I was like, okay. He goes, right. Why is it? Why? Why? Why is it that all you Indian people, not just a few, all of you, speak so bloody fast all the time? Why? Now, we have got a few Indians here. And today I want to tell you the next time somebody asks you that question, please let them know that it's almost two dollars a minute to call outside India. <laughs> it's not a condition. It's a plan. And this is why I love being, I love being Indian because, you know, only in India... We make everything work for us. I mean, Prachi will agree. You know, in, only in India, if a cow stops on the road, it becomes a roundabout. <laughs> we don't move the cow. We give directions using the cow. <laughs> we call our friends and say, Rajesh, from the cow, you take a left. From the horse, you take a right. There's a dog. I'm standing right behind the dog. That's me. <laughs> But anyway, so uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about baking as well. I'm going to have a quick chat with you to find out some embarrassing things that you've uh, you've had in your in your baking life. And uh, so, uh, when it comes to baking, you know, I actually always wonder why is it that they always bake a cake for something uh, like a birthday anniversary? Does anybody know? Does anybody Can you know? Cake? Yes, like any excuse? No, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, because I was just thinking. Uh, did they try other things? Like, was there somebody who decided I'm going to make an aloo ka paratha or a roti and put candles on it? It didn't work. Like, like I always wonder how they came up with the cake. And you know, I think personally, when, when you say cake, I think of birthdays. And when you say birthdays, I don't know if it happens uh, with you guys there. But in India, we also have arranged birthdays. Right? It's very difficult. Because you can't just blow the candles. You have to make a wish. And you have to look very sincere. It doesn't matter if you have closed your eyes and you're abusing everybody in the room. But you have to look like you're actually praying for something. Right? And, and there's always this one guy in the room who wants to put cake on your face. Which, I, I, is anybody here? Does anybody do that as well? No. Oh, really? No. Oh, really? Now you're going to deny it. Yes, there you go. There you go. And, and this, this guy, trust me, or this lady always has one excuse, which is an absolute lie. They always look at you and say, it's okay, it's okay. Cream is good for your skin. <laughs> like, how does that work? And, and I'll leave you guys with this, of course. Uh, I hope you guys are having a good time. Yes? Yeah. Yes? <laughs> good. Uh, so my, my only thing is to my, to my Indian uh, people here, I have one small request. I love being Indian, 
but especially at birthday parties <laughs> i like how prachi is like oh oh he's going to say something <laughs> controversial <laughs> did you see prachi's prachi's eyebrow reacted before her face she went twink <laughs> prachi don't worry don't worry uh i have just one thing that you know as indians i think we have to practice this habit that when you invite somebody home uh for a dinner for a lunch for a birthday party once it's done let them go back home to their own house <laughs> i don't know what it is we take hospitality to a different level right like you know there's a reason why aliens have not landed in india you you think they've not passed us they have passed us so many times but they look down and say don't go here they will not let you leave let's go to the us there's a guy who's just like us his name is trump <laughs> but how have any, any trump supporters here in the room thank god thank god i you know uh, there you go perfect you know i i always i always used to wonder how somebody called donald can be so goofy <laughs> it's it's ironic right but so i was i was i was telling you guys how uh, you know us indians we love hospitality but the thing is you know it it gets too much because you know you you had chai you had coffee you had cake you had samosas you had chicken tikka masala you married his wife he adopted your children it's been 6 months you are stuck in the same house somehow you make it to the door somehow you make it to the door and then they go like okay you're leaving okay take care bye out and suddenly while you're leaving they goes acha listen how's how's your mom how's your dad good how's work come back come back back in the house you're back in the house for a chai you don't even drink chai and you know <laughs> this is the reason this is actually the reason i think that maybe just maybe the british did want to leave india <laughs> we didn't let them they were leaving they were leaving they were at the at the border and we were like how's everything mummy daddy good come on come on come back you have to take the kohinoor <laughs> anyway that's my time guys you guys been a beautiful audience let's give you guys a round of applause thank you what a hoot he is well now we are moving over to find the hotly anticipated competition results with three of the categories that is the wedding cakes the decorative cookies and the sugar flowers have you entered stick around because we're going to find out our winners and guess what we also have a best in show award which is going to be announced at the end of the show so difficult for our judges to decide on this award and we have with us of course our very old favorite chef nicholas lodge our head judge who is going to be announcing the winners over to you nicholas hi everybody i'm chef nicholas lodge head judge for cakeology's online competition i have been amazed to see the number of entries and the quality of entries in this show and i have judged many international shows since 1980 the entries were a mix of international and also indian um competition and uh, the level was of an international standard um it is so nice to see the awards to see obviously who will win and also to see budding artists compete in an international platform we have some great giveaways and prizes for our winners Thank you to all of our partners and sponsors for this. So this is what the first place winner, the second place winner and third place winner will receive. We will be starting with the announcing of the winners of the three categories uh for now wedding cakes, decorative cookies and sugar flowers. 
So let's start with the wedding cake category. Of course, we have three winners, the first, the second, and the third place, but there were some more cakes that definitely needed recognition. And we're very excited that we will also be giving some certificates of merit. There were 12 such cakes in the wedding cake category that need to be obviously uh, displayed and showed to you for the quality of the workmanship on these. So let's start with the third place winner in the wedding cake category. So congratulations, the winner is Payal Paduke. Please give her a big round of applause. So Payal, could you come up on stage to say a few words for everybody, please? Hi, I'm Payal Paduke from Melbourne, Australia. Thank you, Chef Nicholas and Cake Logic for this online competition. I can't believe I won. The second place winner is in wedding cake categories is Priyanka Paul. Please give her a round of applause. <laughs> Priyanka, could you come up on stage to say a few words, please? Hello everyone, I'm Priyanka Paul from Siliguri, West Bengal. Thank you, Chef Nicholas Lodge and Cakeology for organizing this online competition by which we could showcase our work. I'm very thrilled and excited also on winning. And the first place winner in the wedding cake category, I'm very honored to announce this, is Pooja Nanda Sarin. So congratulations, Pooja. So cheer for here. Congratulations. So Pooja, are you there? Could you come up on stage to say a few words? Hello everyone, I'm Pooja Nanda Sareen from Sugar Fancy by Pooja and I would like to thank Chef Nicholas and Cakeology for organizing such an amazing online cake decorating event and giving us a platform to showcase our talents, our skills and uh, I am really really excited to share with you all that I have won this competition which I was not even expecting and I really cannot express my feelings right now. So, Thank you so much, Chef, Nicholas and Cakeology. Looking forward for more such online cake decorating competitions to enhance our skills. Thank you so much. So now we will be announcing the winners of the cookie category. The entries that were received in the cookie category were so many that we had to end up dividing it into the Indian cake artists or cookie artists and international cookie artists just because of the sheer number of entries we had in this division. So we actually have sort of divided the category up into two separate divisions, international competitor and Indian competitor because of the sheer number of cookies we had, which was absolutely amazing. And um, so hence we divided it and we have one list of four cookies, cookie artists that will be receiving a uh, certificate of merit for all the entries that we received, okay? But let's see who, um, obviously, let's see these amazing cookies first. Now let's start with the Indian category for decorative cookies. So these are cookie artists from India. The third place winner is Swati Subanamam. Swati, please come up on stage if you're here to say a few words. Hi, I'm Swati Subramanam from Mumbai. Thank you, Chef Nicholas and Kekalaji for having this online contest. And I really can't believe that I have won it. Thank you. The second prize place winner 
in the cookie Indian cookie division is Nayata Paul. <laughs> Nayata, can you please come up on stage to say a few words? Nayati Paul here, a budding patissier from Nagpur. I've been attending Cakeology for the past two years. And I've been learning from amazing chefs from all over the world, like Yini Sada last year. It was a big dream come true. Uh, really grateful and delighted to win and be a part of Cakeology's first online competition. Such a noble idea. Thank you so much. And the first place winner in the Indian part of the cookie competition is going to be Vivian Francis. So let's congratulate to Vivian. Vivian, please come on stage. Hi everyone, this is Vivian and I'm a home baker from Mumbai. I wanted to thank Ecology for this great platform that they've given me to showcase my work. And this is the first time that I'm participating in a cake competition and it has been a wonderful experience till now. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. So let's now start the international cookie decorative uh, competition. So these are competitors that obviously live outside of India. So the third place winner in the cookie division is Maria Connaught. So congratulations, Maria. So if Maria is there, please could you say a few words? Hi, my name is Maria Connaught. I'm originally Hungarian, living in the UK. I started cookie decorating about five, six years ago as a hobby. Um, I would like to say a big thank you for this opportunity for me to take part in this wonderful competition. Uh, cookie decorating for me is a passion. I really love working with royal icing and I do believe that every single day there's something new to learn. Thank you for watching. The second place winner is Johanna Texaria. So, Johanna, are you there? Congratulations. Ah, I can't believe I won. Are you sure? Thank you to Chef Nicholas and to Cakeology, to my husband for putting up with my things, and to Katarina for pushing me into the competition. Obrigada! And the first place winner in the International Cookie Division is Sylvia Janowski. So congratulations, Sylvia. <laughs> Sylvia, if you'd like to say a few words. Hello from Botswana. I'm very happy to have won the decorative cookies category at the Virtual Ecology Cake Fest competition. I would like to thank the organizers, all the judges, and especially the head judge, Nicholas Lodge. Congratulations to all the winners in the other categories, and of course, congratulations to everyone who participated in the competition. Thanks a lot. Bye. So the next category is going to be sugar flowers, which again, like all the categories, had some amazing entries in them. And uh, in this category, we also had five entries that we will be receiving a certificate of merit for the quality of the work. So let's see those entries first. So now to announce the uh, third place winner for the Sugar Flowers um, is going to be Hewa Wasam Badawaji. Congratulations. So the second prize winner is Jatanjali Chakaborti. So congratulations to Jatanjali. 
So if she'd like to come up on stage to say a few words. Hello everyone. This is Gitanjali Chakravarti from Muscat Oman. Basically I'm from Kolkata. Thank you Kekology and Sir Nikolaj for this wonderful online competition. I'm so excited. I can't believe I have won. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the first place winner is Swetia Damia. So congratulations to Swetia in winning first place in Sugar Flowers. So beautiful. Swetia, please come on stage and say a few words. This is Shweta Damia from Kolkata. Thanks Chef Nicholas and Kekology for having this online competition. I'm so excited to have won the Sugar Flowers category. Thank you. What an amazing standard for our competition and a big congratulations to our winners and also to those of you who took part. Well done to all of you and hopefully we'll see you live next year for the competition. In the meantime, we've got a very special demo for you from the crazy but talented Margarita Ferreira in Italy. She's going to be sharing with you a unique watercolouring style that she's going to paint and she's going to show you exactly how you can do it too. Don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. I want to learn this as well. So I'll be seeing you throughout this interactive demo. Stay with us. Hi everybody, I'm Margherita Ferrara from Italy. I'm a modelling teacher and I'm so happy to be here in Kekologi Kekologi show, sorry. <laughs> we got to learn something different, a new technique, watercolor painting. So I'm waiting for you. Enjoy with me and see you soon. It is super, super exciting to be here with you, Margarita. I feel like I've got a front row seat, like everybody at home. We're looking at the most beautiful piece of art. Are we going to try and do that on icing, are we not? Rosie. Yes. Ciao. Ciao, Bella. Bella <laughs> doesn't know Margarita. She is crazy, 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 but she's also super talented. And we're going to try and put this piece of work onto a piece of icing, but you can do it onto a cake. But this looks really complicated, Margarita. I think you're going to show us a way that anybody can do this, aren't you? Yes, absolutely. Everybody can make it because uh, I will show you that this technique is uh, easy, easy. Uh, and uh, I, I want to explain to you that I uh, make uh, something strange like this, where I put a, a clear transparent film, film food, of course, and uh, where uh, I use to... Um, to get all the all my figure on the field, and then I go to transfer in the in my uh, sugar paste. In this case, of course, I have uh, just a piece that I that I need for this technique. But you can do uh, uh, in the, on the cake directly on the cake, right? So that piece of icing, have you left that to dry for a little while first? Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's better. It's better that you you leave uh, uh, dry a little bit, okay? So you can you can you can uh, use uh, also directly, but if you leave just I don't know ten minutes, five minutes just to dry a little bit, uh, you can uh, uh, work better, okay? Okay, so we've got our clear plastic film. What sort of colors are we going to be using? Uh, I got to uh, use. Uh, in this case, I have just two colors because with this technique that, that is a watercolor painting, uh, you can give a, a different shadow with the, just with the water. So I go to use a gel color. In this case, I have caramel and navy blue, right? And, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, I told you I got to give a different uh, a different um, different uh, shadow with the water, but before we start with the color, I put my color here just a little bit, and I start to draw to painting 
to draw. No, no painting, to draw. <laughs> uh, the, the image that I have here on the film. So you have to be careful just when you start uh, that the, the film is very uh, raw. So it's correct to say flat. Yes. Okay. Very flat. If you want to help yourself, you can put here uh, just um, uh, something that uh, stay uh, um, that stop the, the the film. But I don't use nothing because uh, I try a, a lot of time, <laughs> so I know how it to do. Uh, a different um, brusher with uh, these uh, tips. Okay, one small and one uh, a little bit. A little bit um, larger. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dudley. And then, uh, when I go to use the water, I go to use also this one, bigger. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. So uh, we start with the uh, we start to, to painting to draw, and I start with the blue color, right? So I take, uh, of course, I have my water here that I'm. <laughs> And uh, I use a little bit of water, and the rest is just color, right? Because I need that, um, um, I need that, that, that all the line, uh, I, have to, uh, I have to mark very well on the film. So I need more color than water, right? And I start from the hair. The, the last thing that I got to make is the, uh, is the face, right? Okay. So I go and I start. You, in this case, you can see, you can't see nothing because I have the image in, uh, uh, under the, the, the film, you know? Well, we can see where you're putting the lines. So you're just picking out the shapes that are the most strong, aren't you? You can see some, uh, uh, you Yeah, can we see can see, yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. So, I start from this part, the, the part uh, uh, darker of the of the figure, and then I go to I go to painting the rest, uh, all the detail. Okay, don't worry if you uh, put uh, a lot color because uh, you know that the, uh, the, when you put the color, the film. Uh, 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 what do you say? Not, does it not wrinkle? Does it make a, a, a crinkle shape? Brava, yes. Problem. The, the, the most important that you take all the detail from the face, because the face is the part more important, okay? About the, the hair, you can just draw some line, not all. And now I go to make a flower. And when I make a flower, I make just the, um, the oh God, in English is uh, uh, just just the line of the, the outline, flower. just the yeah. outline at the moment. Yeah. Yes. The outline. Yeah, because uh, after with the water, I uh, I told you before, I go to give uh, the, the all the shadow. Sorry, and because uh, I try to make everything, and you can see well, but okay, this is. Uh, the shoulder, and make the rest of the flower. I hope you don't forget nothing. <laughs> okay, and then I make the the line of the face, and is not easy. Sorry, I want to that you can see everything about. It's not so easy to work. It's very hard upside down, but we appreciate what you're doing in order to show us. I think this is the bit that might scare people to do a face. is is quite frightening. Yeah, uh, 
believe me, if you understand, it's no, uh, it's no difficult to make a face because, uh, uh, the, because this technique uh, permits you to, to really to, to copy everything. Now I make uh, the part inside of the, the eyes. Oh. You're putting more color now. Are you doing that in special dark areas? Uh, I just, uh, yes, I just um, I use the water um, uh, to, 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 to leave, uh, uh, to leave uh, wet the color. Oh, so, so that's water that, you're putting on. All right, okay. Yes, because uh, now I got to use the other color. So I just put a little bit of water uh, in all the parts that I sign, that I draw. So it stay wet. And okay, I get you. Okay. So we and, don't want that color. We don't want any of that outline color to dry out, do we? Yeah, 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 correct. Okay, Lila Bello Fata. So I can start with the other color. Now, of course, when you go to make uh, this technique, uh, you can uh, uh, you can be faster. You can be yes, faster, because now I'm I'm very uh, it's no it's, it's it's no easy to to work uh, in upside the upside down. down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're making it difficult for you. This is like better TV, Margarita. We could make it easy, or we could make it difficult. We like to make it difficult just because it's funnier that way. Okay. Oh, so we've got the caramel color. These are, are these yes, this is this is caramel. Caramel, caramel gel colors. colors. Yeah. And it's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture to start with. Yeah, this is uh Oh, wait, uh, if I remember, ah, c'è scritto qua, yes, I have the name qua. The name is uh, Jason Cien. Uh, of course, uh, I, find, I found the, the, the image from, uh, um, from Pinterest, because you know a lot of people take uh, inspiration from uh, Pinterest. Yeah, Jason yes. Cien, yeah, he, he drew me beautifully, I think. Yes, yes, yes. It's a very I good likeness. Okay, Rosa. Look, uh, I think uh, I, I think uh, I finish. Of course, when you go to now that I go to transfer everything on, in, on the sugar face, uh, then uh, I have my imagine to understand uh, what I have to do. I'm quite excited to see you lift it off and see how much it's it's changed. Okay, so I use again the water just to. So this is just water, and you're just, just trying to water. make it stay wet. Yes. So, now, look, I hope I make oh, it. No. Look, I have my figure, okay? I transfer very fast because uh, I don't know. So I take my face. I put my face and I turn and just leave and like this. Okay. And then now I know, press. Margarita, I know some people will want to know the film that you are using, the yeah. clean film, is that um like um, we call it cellophane. Is it glad wrap? Is it that or is it thicker than that? Uh, the film uh, is, uh, sorry. Is it for food wrap or is food, it? Food, food, yes. Okay. Okay. So that's all you need. See, si, just that. Okay. I try to take, I press it with the, with the finger to transfer all the line, okay. I feel you need some dramatic music because this is quite exciting. So 
when well, it looks the same when you lift it off you can sing you want me to sing yeah I'm prompting you you do not <laughs> okay. no, I'll give you Oh, no, I just, no, you know what? I just hope oh, that everything is good because uh, really with the, with the, uh, with the, this uh, weather is, um, is, uh, everything is so, 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 so dry. So, but I think that we can, uh, don't worry because uh, we are positive. Are you ready? I am very excited. I don't mean to be over exaggerating here. Okay. I tried to see before. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Okay, is ready? Third time we filmed it. Ta 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 Look at that. Oh my gosh, it's wonderful. Okay. So, listen, I have my magic always with me because I want to I want to understand all the shadow, okay? In this moment, now that I start, I use just water, no color, okay? Okay. And so we've got our chunky brushes, our big brushes. Okay, I have, uh, uh, this is the same, sorry, I take uh, the same before, but I use this one, is a, is a bigger than, uh, the, than yeah. the other one before, and this one, because this one, I start, I put water here, okay, with this one, I just start to take a color, look, Doing very lightly. Yes, absolutely. And look, can you see the shadow, Dudley? Yeah. Okay. And if you want more, of course, you can use more water. Uh, don't worry if uh, the paste go to uh, uh, to 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 wet. It's normal, of course. Yes. Then, uh, then uh, the, the base go to 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 dry. It's no problem. Okay, I just started from from uh, the outside to give uh, the first F, F, a watercolor effect. Okay, and so you're just you're picking up a very small amount of the color with the water, aren't you? See, because uh, later. When everything is uh, is um, is ready, uh, you can make uh, this one. So you can take a little bit color more, and you go again in your line because in this case you can make a, a example, make a, a perfect line, and you can take again the line of the hair. You understand what I mean, Dudley? Yes, but just you still haven't added any more color, no more color, just yeah. with the water. Just with the water. And after, if you want to mark uh, or fix uh, some some line, you can get color and just uh, in it. Yeah. yeah, like this, like I make here, just to show you what I mean. Like this, you can see, Dudley? Yes, darling. Okay. With the water, I go to take my different color, okay? And in this case also, I can, uh, I can, uh, I can draw also the line of the hair and the color I put outside for the, from the figure. You understand, Dudley? Yeah, so you're drawing it away. It's a pleasure, darling. Or is it <laughs> in Italian, darling, darling? Uh, tesoro. Tesoro. What does that mean? Tesoro. Tesoro is darling. Oh, tesoro. 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 See, I, I, I think it's a 
amazing that you can talk in somebody else's language and <laughs> describe and teach what you do. But you do, you teach all over the world, don't you? Do you speak oh. art? So when I was in India, they taught me how to say some things. In, in, you have to learn before you come out how to say some things in Indian, Hindi. Yeah, no, it's very, uh, no, this is a very, very good uh, when uh, you go to around the world because you can uh, you can learn a lot, a lot from the language, a lot for everything, you know? So, so you could, where you are now? You, you, you have to come in Italy, eh? Rose, you have to come yes. in Italy. We love Italy. Everybody loves Italy, love Italians, love pizza. What's not to love? <laughs> Love a pizza margarita. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, we love wine. I have no problem with any of Italy. Love, <laughs> love that wine. is a beautiful effect, but that's where you put some extra colour. When you were doing the tracing to start with, you put deeper colour, yeah. didn't you? Uh, if, I, I, if I put a little more colour... You put, where, where you've got the deeper blue colour is where you put extra colour at the beginning, isn't it? Because I, I put more colour here. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Because uh, I, I, I'm, I used to make uh, um, a little detail and the detail of the, of the, of the hair. Because if I, if I use the, 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 um, Oh my God! The brusher this way, I can. Where I get off the color, I put in the rest of the hair. That's my shoulder. Shoulder. <laughs> Don't joking with me. <laughs> with my English, my perfect English. Oh, better than my Italian, darling. Um. <laughs> darling, <laughs> darling. <laughs> Let's get to the drunk. Let's go to the drunk. Yes. All the all the time I remember that. So yeah, for, for everyone at home, we, we love Margarita because she has these little phrases that when she translates them, they're not quite what they should be. They're just beautifully charming and funny. <laughs> but I stress, I say it as Again and again, I cannot believe that you do all of this in, in another language, but, but already in this short time, this thing has completely come to life. Okay. But you, uh, can you see, can you watch good, uh, Rose? Can I do, can I watch what? You can see everything? Yes, we can see it all perfectly. Oh, yeah. okay. Perfecto, perfecto. I'm happy. Perfect. Perfecto is perfect, huh? Eh? It's yeah. the same. Yeah. Okay. Now with this, this one, the smaller one, I go to make the part more difficult. I, I, I have to be honest. It's not very. It's not easy. Okay. <laughs> but everybody can do this. Okay. I start from the eyes. So, of course, if you decide to leave it like this because you want a different effect. I was going to say, it looks quite beautiful as it is, but you I can, can see you're going to do the shading. Yeah, you can leave it like this because, okay. So, of, how I told you before that I have the image just to respect also the, um, oh, wait, see, uh, to respect all this part, no? Yes. Okay. But, when you start, the, the first thing that you have to make is just the, the line, and then you go to work for the for the color and shadow. The shadows, yeah. yeah. And shading. Mamma mia, che difficile al contrario. Okay. What a wonderful technique, though, for anybody who's a little bit underconfident. See, see, see. Do you know something? I know that people are going to ask this, and I think I might know the answer, but is this something you can ever do on buttercream? 
with the buttercream. Yeah. Uh, if you can make this one on the buttercream, did you ask me that? Water would be a problem, wouldn't it? Ah, uh, yes, I think so, darling. I think so. I think you could possibly transfer color, but doing the shading would be very, very. Yes, you can. Yes, you can transfer. I think so, and but onto hard water, yeah. But this icing makes it so much. Yeah. Okay. I think. Uh, and then, look. Uh, if uh, if you make some something wrong, you can use the water to to get off. Okay. In. Okay. Now I try to make all the detail. Right. Yeah, just with the water, okay. I look at my, my figure. I use uh, this color. Uh, look, uh, here I have uh, more blue, so yeah. I will take a blue and uh, wait that I have to understand uh, like this, okay. The face, and I put more water, okay, to give a little bit sense to this face and the nose this the same for the nose look yeah you know and i go i told you i go to make some shadow and here in the eyes to like this whoa it's quite important though isn't it that you keep looking at the original picture you're using all the clues that the picture gives you but yeah, uh, it's important to follow the 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 the, the picture. But uh, believe me, in the, in this case that I work like this, I I, I take all my imagination <laughs> 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 to try to make something different. Okay, but good. <laughs> okay, so we continue also with the with the uh, um, always with the water, and uh, I go to make also here with the I mix uh, the, the two color inside like this okay and and then I go to take the blue color and I try to make uh, the detail Oh, that has totally lifted it. Allora, let's see. Because, you know, when you make the tail up, the, 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 the shadow that you get from the water is, uh, you know, the, 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 I don't know, the look is uh, stronger. You know yeah. what I mean? It's picking out, it's picking out the details. Yeah. The eyes are always the most important bit, aren't they? I think it's good then. Huh? Here, more blue here. Okay, and... This part, I want just to pronounce a little bit the, the shadow here. Okay. Okay. Just like this. And uh, now, how the. Me cago, no colar esta cosa al contrario. Okay, I put a little bit color here, right? Yeah, on the eyelid. Yeah? Yeah, and my mouth is open. I'm concentrating on watching you. I think everybody will be concentrating on watching this come to life. 
Yeah, and I and then I use water and I go to you know to try it's kind of like you're blending her makeup really. <laughs> See. This technique of being able to pull out the colour with the water is so exciting. So you're you're now enhancing the lines that are, are there, pulling out the important parts. Okay. I mean the eye that you've done so far is stunning. Grazie. <laughs> okay, now I go to work with the detail here, but just, and uh, look, I follow the line, the line that I make with the water, okay? Just understand how that is. Huh? Okay, like this. Oh, so we're now pulling up. The, the, the important lines again. Yeah, but for me it's easier because uh, because I have just my uh, uh, I don't know if correct my design that I make before with the water. You understand what? Yeah, I mean? you've got the outline already there. So now, are you using the gel color again? See, but so just the, just you know uh, like this. Just yeah. to just remember, to... yes, just to remember some line from uh, the, 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 the figure, you know, just like this. Yeah. And of course, I made something in the other part, but not all, because I had my, um, the, this work that uh, give the sense of the, the hair. You understand what I mean, Dudley? Yeah, you, so you've, you've done the hard work. You're just pulling out the import, the accent lines. We'd call them accents. Si, si, bravo. Here, something here. Whoa, whoa. And I put water I'd love to see, if people are going to do this, I'd love to see what they choose to do because I think this is a beautiful choice. But I reckon I'm, I'm going to now look at loads and loads of pictures and think, oh, wouldn't that look nice on the cake? Oh, do you do that? Do you go through the shops and see something and think, oh, I want to make that into a cake? I do that all the time. That's got such movement in it. Yes, uh, because uh, sometimes I said that maybe it's better if I make like this because um, uh, you know, maybe it's a um, um, uh, wait, wait, wait. Now I, I tell you what uh, what I mean. Huh? Um, um, when you have uh, when you have all the line, all the detail, everything uh, ready that you think is ready. Okay, you can start to give uh, your personal touch. Okay. Yeah. Hug. Cuddle, hug people. See, <laughs> we all need a great big cuddle. I need it to hug you, Dudley. Yes, exactly. What a complete stunner she is. Absolutely beautiful. I just, I think that everybody understood the technique, so I just give the last line here.
And here I give a little bit more color for the neck. Uh, such a cool technique, isn't it? Okay. I think the face is good. Okay, Rosa. Margarita Ferrara, you are amazing. You are amazing. You Thank are you. incredible. But I, 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 can, I can turn the, the camera to see you. You can, we can see you. Let's have a look at you. See, okay. So before I, I showed my work and you have made I turned the camera. Some... Ooh. <laughs> this Such is like beautiful, beautiful. <laughs>So now we get to meet someone who's been our registration partner from the very beginning, owner of Morday Chocolates. Please welcome Mr. Harshal Morday. Hi, welcome. I um, hope you're having a good day. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Morday journey so far? Thank you. We are glad to be associated with Cakeology. Morday's journey has been very rewarding and fulfilling. We are India's largest chocolate and cocoa processors for 37 years with 150 plus recipes being catered to various segments. Our distribution and retail partners deliver our goods in every corner of the country. Our customers have given us an ample opportunity for innovation and continuous growth. We have enjoyed this mutually enduring relationship. Every second chocolate, patisserie, confection and baked product is made with Mode. These products are made at a world-class automated facility for the last 37 years, and we are proud to be made in India. And how do you feel about the business opportunities for the home baker? Home bakers is a very, very promising niche. It's a very creative, innovative, agile, and fast evolving space, very good for collaborative working. Home bakers are going to play an important role in the new SME space creation. There will be many professional household success stories evolving out of home baking space. We are very excited to work with all the home bakers. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Morday. Good to speak to you and hope you'll stick with us for the rest of the show. for you that we've never done before we've got some fun facts about cakes yeah you might not think that cakes are funny but knitting mirani definitely is so here's knitting with a little bit of fun fact about cake <laughs> Hi everyone, this is Nitin Birani and welcome to Bake Laughs brought to you by Cakeology. Um, you know, before we start this right now, I had something very interesting that, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I'm not somebody who's baked anything in his life. Uh, I bake a lot of stories, uh, which I probably will be sharing with you. But I've come up with these four very, very fun and interesting facts, uh, which is absolutely true. And I want to share these facts with you. Uh, fact number one, apparently in ancient America, a cake was something that they would enjoy eating. But many people believed that putting a fruitcake under the pillow will get you a handsome husband or a wife. Now, 
पर्सनली इवन दो दिस थिंग वर्क आई वुड रियली रेकमेंड नॉट पुटिंग अ फ्रूट केक ओवर नाइट अंडर योर पिलो बिकॉज आई एम प्रिटी श्योर दैट यू माइट फाइंड handsome husband or a beautiful wife but you will definitely lose out on your maid and your house help because she has to clean that and uh, most of us already know that that finding a house help or a maid in the world today is no piece of cake so yeah uh, our, our second fun fact is the fact that the red velvet recipe was actually an act of revenge uh, one of the interesting cake facts is that the red velvet uh, uh, as a lady uh, ate a red velvet in a cake restaurant and liked it so much uh that she asked the restaurant for the recipe and they charged her 100 dollars for the recipe and she became so angry that she said you know what i'm going to give this recipe to everybody for free and that was her revenge so pretty much next time uh, you're going to be eating a red velvet cake uh, please remember that you're not eating a cake it's full of revenge ki ye aurat ne uska badla liya hai so i think maybe maybe i i don't know i think from now on what i'm definitely going to be walking into places and saying can i have a slice of uh, red velvet revenge quite what another fun fact uh, a person living in the uae now this is exciting news because i have lived in the uae for the for the longest time and i pretty much know that this is this could be 100% true um, so a person living in the uae brought the world's most expensive cake yeah makes sense but the cake was actually priced at 75 million dollars 75 million dollars for a cake i mean uh, you know i can just imagine what happened to the guy after that because see if you honestly me being a sindhi if you buy uh, a cake for 75 million dollars uh, there's two things that will happen one is you definitely won't be able to afford any candles to put on the cake nor will you be able to afford a house to cut the cake in so whoever has bought this cake for 75 million dollars man uh, i don't know you are the only person who can have their cake and eat it too literally um another fun fact is that uh, in the past on the wedding day and on the wedding cake uh, it was not a cake at all eventually back in the day uh, they should they didn't use wedding cakes uh, for weddings they used to use a piece of bread uh, and this is of course in ancient rome and the bread was actually broken over the bride's head uh, to symbolize good fortune uh, for the couple honestly speaking i'm so glad that this thing is not happening right now keeping in mind the sizes of the cakes that people come up with and the very fact that if they try to break that on your head uh, i don't think the wedding will go as planned <laughs> Well, now it's time to announce the winners from the next three categories of the competition. We've got the decorative cupcakes, the decorative exhibits, and the beginner level cake. So, if you entered those categories, stay tuned because we're about to go over to Nicholas Lodge to announce the winners. Don't forget that we are going to announce the best in show award at the end of this show. In the meantime, Nicholas, it's over to you. Hi, everybody. I'm back. We will now be announcing the winners of the next three categories: decorative exhibits and structured cakes. Uh, then the next one is going to be decorative cupcakes, and then finally the beginner level cakes for a special occasion. So let's begin. Let's start with the decorative exhibits and structured cakes. In this category, we had eight entries that will be receiving a certificate of merit. So let's go ahead and see these other eight incredible. Uh, competition entries. start with the third place winner it's aditi gawari so if you could come up and say a few words 
Hi, I'm Aditi Garware from Pune and I'm so thankful to Chef Nicholas and Cakeology for hosting this amazing online cake competition. I'm very, very excited and I can't believe I have won. Thank you. Thank you so much. The second place winner is Lanin Kumar. So congratulations, Lanin. So please say a few words. Hello everyone, I'm Lene from Bangalore. Thank you Chef Nicholas and Cakeology for organizing this event. I'm so excited to have won in it. And the first place winner in the decorative exhibits and structured cakes is Safrina Latif. So congratulations. Would you like to say a few words? I'm Safrina from Qatar. Thank you, Chef Nicholas and Cakeology for this amazing opportunity. I'm really excited to have won it. The next category will be decorative cupcakes. In this category, we had seven additional entries that will be getting a certificate of merit. So let's see who they are. Let's see who the winners are. In third place winner in the decorative cupcakes and the, this winner is Payal Koduke. So congratulations. Would you like to say a few words? I'm Payal Koduke from Melbourne, Australia. Thank you Chef Nicholas and Cake Lodger for this online competition. I'm so excited to have my cake in it. The second place winner in the decorative cupcakes is Roshni Shukla. So congratulations. Would you like to say a few words? Hi, I'm Roshni Shukla, a home baker from Bangalore, Karnataka. I would like to thank Chef Nicholas and Cakeology for organizing this wonderful online event and competition. I am so happy and honored to be declared a winner in it. Thank you. And the first place winner in decorative cupcakes is Sylvia Janowski. Congratulations. So Sylvia, would you please come up on stage and say a few words? Thanks a lot. Wow, I'm so happy I have won the decorative cupcakes category at the virtual Cakeology Cake Fest competition. So now let's go on to the last category for now. That is the beginners level special occasion cakes. We had the most amount of cakes and entries in this, uh, in this particular division. It was huge. So had uh, over 200 um, entries in this one division alone. Um, this category was for people who basically we're classing as a beginner who have just started in the industry. Uh, also for people who are budding and maybe haven't been recognized in a major competition like this. So remember that entering a competition is all about, you know, getting started. And uh, even if you didn't win, you are still a winner in our eyes because everybody has to start somewhere. And a competition is not about always winning. It's about the journey to get there. And hopefully this will give you confidence to next year at Cakeology when we have an actual competition, not a virtual one that you will enter obviously in, uh, in the competition. So we actually had um, such a huge uh, standard in this division that we actually have 10 entries that deserve the certificate of merit. So let's have a look at those first.
So now on to the winners. So the third place winner in the beginners level special occasion cakes is Michelle Pinherio. So congratulations, Michelle. So if you'd like to say a few words. Hi, I'm Michelle Pinero from Mumbai. I just want to thank Cakeology for giving unrecognized home bakers like myself the opportunity to showcase our work on such a large platform. It only motivates and encourages us to do even better work in the future. This is the first time that I have submitted my work to Cakeology and I'm so glad that my work was liked and appreciated. So once again, thank you Cakeology for the opportunity and the entire team who put this online cake contest together. Thank you once again. And the second place winner is Selma Lopes. So congratulations, Selma. So wonderful work. Selma, would you like to say a few words? Hello, I'm Selma from The Magical Oven. Thank you, Chef Nicholas and Cakeology for organizing this event. I can't believe I've won in it. Thank you so much. Stay home, stay safe. And the first place winner in the beginners level special occasion cakes is Anupma Agwal. So congratulations. Anupur, would you like to come up on stage? Hi, I'm Anupma Agarwal. I'm a home baker from Jaipur, Rajasthan. And I'm thankful to Chef Nicholas and Cakeology for organizing this online competition. And I'm super excited to have one in it. So we get a little brief intermission from the show. We're just going to have a quick chat to one of our amazing partners for Cakeology. It's from Magic Colours, Shika. Hi, Shika. Hi, Rosie. How are you? I'm very well. Uh, just quickly, tell us a little bit about um, the opportunities for Magic Colours and the journey so far. Magic Colours has had a tremendous journey in India up till now. Yes, it is a baby of Lee and Yari from Israel. And then this, again, another plant which has grown up in India and a continuous it has and the opportunities business-wise for communities in the home baking industry? Home baking industry is actually growing a lot in leaps and bounds after this lockdown. So everybody earlier, there was no access to good quality products and people was, uh, had to be content with whatever was available. But now because of magic colors, they get all the quality products anytime, everywhere across India and it's easily accessible at very good affordable prices. So and we're really, makers. really looking forward to seeing you in person at Cakeology. Sure. Amazing to have such top class sponsors. Um, you're gonna stick with us for the show next? Sure, see you. are going to be going over to another interactive demo this time with the very talented Vicky Tether who's going to be showing us some cute little miniature toppers for your cupcakes but before that let's have another lucky draw for all you lovely attendees <laughs> Okay, it is time to spin that wheel. Oh, who's it going to be? Did you register? This could be you. And the winner is <laughs> Swati Ketre. Well done, congratulations. Raise your hand, Swati. You are our winner from our lucky draw. 
Hi everyone, my name is Vicky Tether and I run the Elegy Cake Company. I am very honoured to be one of your judges this year at Cakeology. What an amazing show. And today I'm going to be showing you how to create a really cute set of cupcakes. They're beach barbecue kind of food themed. Really, really cute, cartoony and fun. And I really hope you enjoy watching with me. Vicky Tether, we're making little itty bitty cupcakes, aren't we? We are indeed. We're going to make some really cute little summer kind of beach picnic themed cupcakes. I can see you're kneading already. Let's get cracking. Straight in there. Indeed. What are we going to make first? We're going to be making the little hamburger and the hot dog. So <laughs> these guys. So, you know, no summertime is complete without a barbecue, is it? Uh, so you're kneading the stuff. But everyone's going to say, how on earth do you get your figures so cute and smooth and perfect? And I bet you're going to say it starts here. It does. You have to make sure your paste is nice and warmed up and supple before you start. If when you're working with it and when you're kneading it, you notice you're getting little cracks and creases around the corners, it's not quite ready yet. So get it nice and supple and then into a really nice smooth ball. So if you struggle with so many times from people who are very new to, to decorating is they want to know how you get them to look so perfect. And every expert I've seen who are my idols have done exactly what you're doing now, which is concentrate and getting right from the start. Yeah. Yeah. So you always start with a ball. Even if you're making a cube, you start with a ball because that's the best way to get a nice, smooth surface. And if you have trouble with getting the cracks disappearing, like sometimes I'll do it, I'm rolling away, and I'll have this really stubborn, annoying crack, and I just cannot get rid of it. Try rolling it the opposite way. So if you normally roll clockwise, try anti-clockwise. Because for some reason, there's some magic there, and it might get rid of that crack for you. It kind of works 90% of the time. So I'm just doing the top of the burger one at the moment. And unfortunately, in the UK, we've currently got some nice rainy weather, so it's very humid here at the moment. Oh, really? Uh, so got... for, for, for a change in, the, yeah, in a change. rainy weather? Yeah, the British summer. So I'm using oh, quite a bit of cold weather. Oh, to be in India. <laughs> yeah. But like also rains a lot. <laughs> so, I don't know. But I'm using quite a bit of corn flour that I wouldn't normally use um, because my hands are getting hot and moist from the weather. So it, corn flour I use, it's put it in some nylon here, so I don't get too much on my hands. So you can probably barely see it on the camera there. Um, you don't want to use too much, otherwise it will start kind of affecting the paste. So you just want a little bit just to stop your fingers from sticking. So that is the top of the bun there. So I've just rolled a ball and then just used my fingers just to pinch it into a dome shape. And now I need the bottom. Now, I don't tend to weigh things um, when I'm working for myself. I'll just take a piece of paste, roll it into a rough shape. So this has got creases and cracks on it squash it into the shape that I want and then test it. Does that look okay? Yes, it does. Okay, then I roll it back up into a ball and make it nice. Um, so if it didn't look okay, I'd, I'd remove or add some paste just to kind of until I got to a result that I was happy with. It's only when I write tutorials that I actually go through and make sure that everything's weighed out. Every, other than that, it's all just guesswork. So I'm just using my little finger there just to go around the outside, just to flatten that off. Otherwise, you end up with quite a curved shape on the edge. I don't want that. I want it to be a little bit squarer. We now have our base. I'm just going to check that is roughly the same width as the top. So it needs to be a little bit wider. So that is our burger base so far. They look a bit uncooked though this is raw burgers so oh. we're gonna add some dust to that in a minute just to kind of make it look at least like it's edible otherwise it's kind of a horrible shade of i don't know beige and are you using just sugar paste on its own no i'm using serotino modeling paste for this um it's you want to use a nice firm modeling paste particularly if you've got warm hands um which i do um otherwise when you touch it, it moves and you'll change the shape of it too easy. Whereas this is a nice stiff paste so that when you work with it, you don't knock the shape back out of what you've just created. So I'm now making the hot dog roll. I think that was too big. So again, we're going back into a ball. With the Serotino paste as well, you can colour it yourself. Um, any modelling paste that's pre-made is fine. So whichever one you get on with the most, go with that. People with colder hands may find Serotino too tough for them. So we've got a little sausage shape. The other thing I like about this paste is it kind of sticks to me as I work, so I can just kind of use that to its advantage. So 
So we need to cut a crease in our bun. So I'm going to use the thick needle. This is a scriber tool for royal icing, I believe, but it's quite nice at cutting without actually leaving a cut edge. I don't know if you guys can see, but we've got a nice smooth cut there. And then I'm going to go in with the Dresden tool, just the wide end, and just stroke that just to open up the burger bun. Sorry, the uh, hot dog bun. I love a Dresden tool. I know, it's my favourite. It's my favourite. It's the mm. stupidest thing to have as your favourite, but it is. It's the, yeah, just a little basic tool. Like, I Don't love you... it. I went, I went to a class once where they were using the, um, is it immaculate? No, not immaculate confections, the sugar shapers. This um, kind of very new, different type of tool that had just been bought out and they didn't have Dresden tools because they wanted us to use this set of tools. And I was like, with my Dresden! <laughs> and I was genuinely, for two days, I was just like, oh, what do I do without this tool? You just so, you get so used to it. If I lose my Dresden tool, I get very, very upset. Very well, upset. I've, I've got lots now. I have like a collection. Because this one's quite nice. This is the new Squire's Kitchen one that they just released. Um, very similar to the PME one. But you've got the gem one, which is um, kind of pointier. So that's quite nice for different things as well. And then the Serrat or Cherrat, however you pronounce it. They're also really nice as well. Anything with a slightly different shape. But I must admit, this one or the PME one are like the ones that I go to. So I'm now making the burger bun. So I've just got some chocolate brown coloured modelling paste. Now you can use this when it's a dark colour. I tend to actually use the pre-coloured paste because it's just too much hassle to try and colour up large amounts. However, the um, Magic Colours Chocolate Extra is actually quite a nice shade. So I use that quite a lot. I'm just doing a small piece. So you want quite a dark brown for your burger because this has been char grilled. <laughs> It's proper bird. And I'm just going round with a ball tool, just to kind of dimple the edge, make it look like a burger patty. Now, when you're doing kind of cartoony work, which is what I specialise in, I guess, um, you're kind of looking to create shapes and textures without going OTT. So you don't want to add too much. You just want to give kind of a little hint that this is something, rather than just a, a flat cylinder, this is, it's a burger now, it's got some little dimples and dents in it. If you're doing realism work, then you're going to go in with a lot more detail, and when you're dusting it later, a lot more colours and depth and things. But with cartoons, you're bringing stuff back, right back to the basics. And um, realism can be great as well, but I tend to think that the general public really like a cartoony type cake. They love the simplicity of cartoon figures, animals, shapes. I think, you know, if you're talking about children as well, it, it might not be as accomplished to do something that is um, cartoony in terms of getting something that's really real, but yeah. I think it's very much more popular, isn't it? It makes people happy, I think. I think a lot of the art that we see now with the really, really hyper-realistic stuff, you look at it and it's more of an art piece. Yeah. You're not looking at it as a food thing anymore. You're looking at it as art. Whereas with something like this, you look at it and you appreciate it and it just makes you happy. So, And yeah, as you say, for kids' cakes, which is where most of orders will come from, it's for little kids. It's absolutely perfect. Right, so I'm just going to get the dust out now. So I've got my main parts so when you're dusting you want to make sure you don't do it on your work board because it will stain um, and it's really really hard to get off afterwards um and you'll end up probably with just a streak of horrible color forevermore very upsetting i like my nice clean whiteboard so i'm just using um sugar flare cream here it's a really nice color for baked goods i always <laughs> use that one any pastries or anything like that it's such a wonderful color I don't, it's not cream, though. This is the thing. They say it's cream. It, it's not cream. So I've just got a very fluffy paintbrush here. I'm just loading that up with colour. And I'm going to go over, just kind of gently stroke and go over. So I'm not pushing too hard with the paintbrush. This is akin to putting blusher on your face or a bit of eyeshadow. I always describe it in my classes. When you're painting, it's like your eyeliner and your lipstick. When you're dusting, it's your blusher and your eyeshadow. I'm just going over that. So we've kind of, I don't know if this is coming up on camera, actually. We've, but... ba 
your bun now. We are baking the bun. I do not have a bun in the oven, though, before that one <laughs> pops up. So let me see if you can, guys can see that on camera, the difference in the colour. So that's kind of flat and doughy looking, and that one's got a nice golden sheen. Unfortunately, sometimes these dusts don't show up on camera. I find that quite a lot when I'm shooting tutorials. I'm like, oh, it's disappeared. You have to go really, really bright with it, and then it doesn't look that good in Except when you put them against each other, you could definitely see the difference. It looks That's good. Good. So with this one, I'm going around the bottom edge because I don't. If I because it's such a small surface area that's going to be seen. If I just dust the whole thing, it will lose the effect because it'll all just look like one flat colour. So I'm just going around the bottom edge of the base of the bun, so the top edge. So you won't be able to see this probably. It's going to be one of those little details that just disappears, but. There is a slightly paler line going around the top there. So that is our bun done. Now we've got our hot dog. Go in so I'm right into the middle. And then brushing up and down. We've added a little bit of colour to that as well. And then going to go in with the Squires brown. It's quite hard to find quite a dark enough brown, I find, for a lot of these things. Um, and the Squires brown is quite a dark, rich, chocolatey brown. So it doesn't show up maybe as much on this dark brown paste, but it is there. Just adding a little bit of char grill. If I was going to do an open topped burger, I would have drawn some lines across there with the Dresden and then shaded the lines so it looks like it's been on a griddle. And that's really nice and effective. Got that, and then we have our hot dog sausage. So I'm just going to mix the two colours together because the pale colour won't show up and the dark brown will be way too dark. So I'm just kind of mixing them together. And then I'm going to go along the ends, a bit more brown. You're lucky you've got quite delicate fingers. I do have tiny hands. <laughs> that being said, actually, one of my, uh, like, she was a student, she became a close friend, and she was always saying to me, oh, I wish I could do such delicate, tiny work as you. And I mean, this to me isn't that tiny, but, you know, she, she was really wanting to do it. Um, and she came to a class a couple of years ago, and she actually made stuff that was smaller than what I had made. And her hands are quite large. She always describes them as farmer hands. Their hands are huge. So you can do it no matter how big your hands are. It's just a case of getting used to how you hold stuff. I remember when I first started, I watched a tutorial with a lady who had really long fingernails. And I was like, how on earth do you do that? I managed to stab my cake just with like really short nails. So how is this? Oh, possible? I think it everyone who's it. got fingernails has that, you know, when you get that smooth surface and suddenly Ooh, you stab it. <laughs> That's me. This is why I hate covering cakes, because I am an incredibly clumsy person. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm fair modelling. I'm less likely to whack it. So I've just stuck my burger onto the base there, and I'm just going to put a little bit of glue in there and pop my sausage in. So that's our start of our hot dog going on there. And with this paste, you don't actually always need to use the glue. It quite often sticks to itself, um, mainly, usually when you haven't dusted it, though. So when you dust it, it actually kind of stops it from sticking. I'm just going to give this a wipe because I can see some dust. There we go. Sneaky dust colour that will appear later on. So now I'm going to make the cheese. We're just doing the little kind of garnishes for the burgers now on the hot dog. I keep calling it burgers. I do fancy a barbecue now, it has to What's be said. In this weather, have you got rain? No, no, no. Honestly, I'm hungry and they look good. <laughs> I don't think they'd be very filling, would they? <laughs> no. It's like the Marks Probably and Spencer's good for the diet. burgers. <laughs> it's a canapé. So you can use a square cutter for this if you have one in the correct size. I try to avoid using cutters, mainly because they cost quite a lot of money, take up quite a lot of space. Um, so if you can get away with cutting it freehand, and the square is going to be one of the easy spaces, uh, shapes that you can do freehand, then do so. And I'm just going to pop that over there. 
pull the cheese down a little bit just to give it a little bit more life to it, I guess. Might need to glue that. Another tip, actually, um, when I'm working, when you're doing modelling, especially small stuff, you're going to have lots and lots of small pieces of paste in different colours. It's worthwhile keeping them because you never know kind of when you might need a little piece of yellow or a little piece of red. And there's no point throwing it away if it's perfectly clean and usable. If it's been in, in contact with buttercream or ganache, then I would throw it away. But as long as it's just been used on something like this, then keep it. So now I'm just going to do the catch up and this is going to be a freehand shape. So again, starting with that ball. And then I'm just going to use my fingers just to pinch and pull because I want this to look like a dollop of ketchup. Splat and splat. i tell you what, I do love those splat cutters that came out a couple of years ago. I, don't, I haven't actually bought them, but I do keep looking at them thinking, oh, <laughs> do I need you? Potentially. Uh, just put that over the top there so you can see it's just kind of hanging over the edge. And then a little bit of glue on top there. And then pop lid on see this paste is so firm that i can give that a really hard squeeze and it's really not changing the shape of it it's such a nice paste for that so there we have our little burger now we go back to our hot dog so for this one that that shading has made all the difference it has even if i have just taken the whole thing yeah so we're going to do the little swirl of ketchup on the hot dog now. Now, if you are a confident piper, then feel free to do this with royal icing. I, on the other hand, cannot pipe to save my life. So I roll it out and do it the hard way, I think. This is much more time consuming. So I'm just using the palm of my hand. I've got my hand really, really tense, so I'm flattening out the palm of my hand as much as I can. And then just using opposite hand just to roll that out. If you have trouble with kind of creating grooves and lumps and bumps, you can use a cake smoother. I don't have one here with me, unfortunately, but you put it on your work surface and then roll over with the smoother and that will take away all of those lumps and bumps. Just don't press too hard, otherwise you will squash it. I've done that before. So with this one, I don't want to paint a stripe of glue because it's just going to be too much. So I'm just going to add a little bit of glue in kind of key points where I think I want the paste to sit. And then every time I get to one of those points, I just turn the paste back round again. So I've got a little bit too much paste there. So I'm just going to cut that with my fingernail and then just put that back in again. And then we have our little hot dog there. So that's two of our toppers done. Next one I'm going to go on to is the uh, watermelons. They're a very cute little quite easy shape you can do to add to quite a few cakes actually they're quite like kind of you can use them on kawaii cakes and all sorts i actually put them on a christmas cake last year so did a kitsch christmas cake theme so again with the red paste i buy this pre-colored because it's just it's too much work trying to color up such a deep shade just kneading that you can see this paste is a little bit old so you can see all the kind of uh, stretched out rough pieces of paste there so i need to give this a little bit more work if you're finding that your paste is dry and you can't get it to kind of come back to life again get a little bit of uh, cold boiled water and mix that in um, that will just kind of rejuvenate the paste a little bit just to kind of give it that little bit more life have you ever tried glycerin because sometimes a drop of glycerin if you've got like little Sheets of glycerin in, in the cupboard can also help it to stretch a bit better. I tried, I don't know if it was glycerin, I think it's probably liquid glucose, which I thought maybe might be the same thing. <laughs> it's not no, a good G. <laughs> they're so, slightly I, different, but I think they both would probably do the same thing. I did that years like years ago, but it, it failed. But that was with some really bad sugar paste, supermarket owned brand sugar paste. So we'll just put that down to the fact the paste was rubbish. <laughs> so just flattening that out with my hands. You can use a rolling pin as well. So we've got this rough shape. I'm only interested in two triangles from this, so it doesn't really matter what shape I get from the whole thing. I just need one curved edge there. So I'm just going to get some white. Now this is 
an old block of white paste, so it's really starting to dry out nice. You can kind of see how crumbly it is, but it will come back to life. Just got to give it a little bit more work. You have tiny fiddly fingers. You've got to have patience, haven't you? Yeah, but weirdly, I, ha I don't have patience much in life. I kind of go from naught to angry very quickly, but when it comes to icing, I chill out. All right. Spend ages. Well, do you not think that people who make cakes, we're all in a little bit of a club, that we all get it? We get that everything takes longer than you think it's going to take. Yeah. We get you're never going to get as much sleep as you thought you were going to get. <laughs> and we get that you never managed to quite finish your cake the way you wanted to because you've run out of time. Yeah. I think we all get it. Yeah, it's just one of those jobs. And I think it's when you're an artist, you, you kind of have this view in your head of what you want it to look like. And then it turns out and you're like, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> but sometimes it's better. So, you know, you can't always complain. So I'm just adding a little bit of glue there because so these two pastes were a little bit dry. So I want to make sure they're bound together. And again, I'm not worried about the rest of this. I'm just going to focus on that top edge. So I'm just packing that in because the white around the watermelon isn't that thick. So it started as a sausage and then I'm patting it down so it's more of a strip. The reason I've not rolled it out and cut it is because you're going to end up with a cut edge around the front of the piece, which you really don't want. So if you can get away with shaping something by hand rather than rolling and cutting, then it will end up with a nicer effect at the end. So now I'm moving on. Oh, that's in the way, isn't it? Now I'm moving on to the green. That's a nice green. It is. This is the Magic Colours Garden Green. Nice kind of vibrant, bright greens. I often find with greens, some of them are a bit dirgy. They're a bit depressing mm. where they're kind of, they're made for flower work. And I like the bright colours. I think I might be a giant child, as you were saying earlier about kids' cakes. I just like bright things. <laughs> Makes because you actually are... Do you, you've got a book on animals, haven't you? Little animal models. Yeah, it's got people in it as well. Everyone seems to oh, have you? Just, yeah. Hang on, let me, I'll bring it across for you quick. I did, I did get it out. I don't know which way up you are. Oh, no. look. So it's got the... Uh, it's upside down to us, but don't worry about that. We get the there gist. <laughs> so, yeah, it's um, got 50 different characters in it. So lots and lots of cute little animals and bits. So if you like bright cartoony stuff, it's kind of the perfect book for you, really. I'd buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and the best news is you can get it, hopefully, on the local Amazon. It is on quite a few of the worldwide Amazons. But if not, the book depository sells it with free worldwide delivery, so you don't end up being crucified with um, horrible postage costs so which i hate i hate paying postage right so i'm just going to cut this in half now and then i'm going to cut a segment out of that so it's almost like a pizza a little bit of pizza coming in there so again i don't need that pizza the same way <laughs> you can do a pizza yeah make some little uh, pepperonis and stuff I do love the fact that I'm saying about meat. I don't actually eat meat. <laughs> I've done burgers. And I'm like, no, I'm vegetarian. I'm just smoothing off. As I was saying earlier about those cut edges, I don't know if that's picking it up on camera necessarily, but you've got these kind of little ridges and bits that have popped up where I've cut that, whereas the, um, the edges on the front are really nice and smooth. You might be able to see it there, that kind of rough cut edge. So this is where, when Rose was asking at the beginning, how maybe people get such a nice finish it's because when you do cut you take time to smooth it with your finger so it's the heat and the pressure from my finger is kind of pushing that paste back together and neatening it up so we now have our two little wedges and we are going to use a black pen you want a fairly thick nib don't want the little thin ones and then i'm just going to push that in at an angle so you end up with a nice kind of seed shape without really putting any effort into it. It's just the shape of the, the uh, tip. There we go. We've got some little cute watermelons. And 
And right, so now we're going to go on to the donut, which is my favourite part of the whole thing. I had three donuts today, Rose. <laughs> three. You actually ate three donuts? Yes. <laughs> full size or miniature? No full size ones, jam donuts. Well, this is at dinner time for me. So I was like, well, if I have kind of like a donut and some sandwiches for lunch, that will keep me going until like late afternoon. And then I'll have two donuts <laughs> before I do this to give me a nice sugar boost. So I'm full of the joys of donut at the moment. <laughs> so just rolled that into a nice smooth ball. If you do end up with the, the creases and cracks on there and you try your hardest and you just can't get rid of it, try and put it underneath. So if there's a crack, that would be the base and I'd hide it underneath. Or if I was going to stick something over the top, then I'd use that just to hide it. Because sometimes paste just doesn't play ball. I think that's my mean. best tip for being a great cake decorator is learn how to hide your mistakes. Oh, yeah, and there is always a back. <laughs> the hardest back. cakes are the smooth, clean. Mm -hmm. This is why I don't no do wedding steam. cakes. Oh, that's why I put so much rubbish on my cakes. Loads of flowers. Every flower is a crack. <laughs> I think I might have learned to model just to hide the mistakes that I'd made because <laughs> I'd, I'd cover a cake and it would look really good. And as you were saying earlier, then I'd somehow manage to slap it with my hand. So I ended up with kind of a knock in it. And it oh, no. Oh. So, yeah, I to do with hiding the boo-boos and the, the top edge of the cake, the elephant skin, you get around the top edge of the cake and things like that. It's like, it's not for me. And like, I think people feel like they have to be perfect when they're modeling and you really don't to go with your skill. Well, you know, so if you're really good at piping, then go with that. If you're good at modeling, go with that. You don't have to be good at piping, modeling, covering cakes, gnashing and all the rest of it. I've got quite a limited set of skills that I use. I'm good at modeling. Don't ask me to pipe. I might do it live one day, me piping, just so everyone can have a laugh. So I've just stretched out, just like I did with the tomato ketchup piece, a piece of pink paste. So we've got this kind of drizzly glaze going over the top there. And then I'm going to use the bulbous cone tool, which is actually a tool that I never used until probably about six months ago, and I suddenly realised how cool it was. So I'm just going to push that in there. So I've created this kind of centre and then I'm going to use a ball tool, and just go in the bottom there. Now it's coming out the back and you've got all this kind of horrible torn paste coming out. So I'm just going to use the tool again. So this is the bottom. Nobody's going to see it, so don't worry about it. And now we have our little cute donut. I've got a little packet of sprinkles here, or jimmies, I think the Americans call these. And I am going to paint. Always lose my glue brush during demos, don't know why. Put some edible glue over the surface. So you can use any sprinkles, like whatever, like I don't know if the supermarkets over there, like eat readily stock them. I chose these because they're such bright colours. I absolutely love the colours on these. And that, again, just like with the dusting on that, that completely jazzes that up and makes it into a, a nicer piece, I think, rather than just a piece of kind of the brown and pink. That's the um, painted colour. Right, so where are we at? We're on the ice cream. Back to my bag of brown. This is my odd job bag of brown. I don't know if the colours are coming out on there, but I have so many different random shades of brown. Don't you think it's really nice for people? Because people who are watching, some of them may want to be entering the competition, the Cakeology competition, mm -hmm. and all of these things are judged on how um neat they are the, the, the actual pre presentation and i think it's really heartening to watch people who are really good and see how much effort it does take to make the finish nice to make yeah. it all perfect it doesn't come naturally it doesn't come straight away and i've seen people that i've considered my idols and felt really heartened by the fact that it takes them a while to get that finish perfect as well Oh, gosh, yes. I mean, mm. people have asked me to do a live demo of um, a character, like a human, and they're like, you've got an hour. And I'm like, right, I get the legs no. done in an hour. <laughs> like, what, what do you think I'm going to get done? It takes me ages. Yeah, absolutely. I just end up kind of going back and forth. I roll it out. I think, mm, and I fiddle with it, and I look at it, and I walk off, and I come back to it, and it's just like, no, I can't be doing stuff quickly. It's not happening. 
I mean, for me, I mean, especially with the competition, if you've never entered a sugar craft competition before, really go for it because the feedback that I got from my first competition actually helped me to become a better artist. They told me quite a few little things, like I'd used royal icing to stick my pieces onto the cupcake topper. And you could see it. And she was like, well, we've marked you down. You shouldn't be able to see it. So if you just use a little damp paintbrush and wipe the royal icing away. And I was like, oh, that is genius. So the judges will give you top tips on how to kind of better your work. And I am judging the competition, so I will hopefully be able to give some of you guys some nice top tips on how so to... you waffled your a... cone there? I have waffled it. And I'm also waffling, Rose. Right. So I'm using right. that scribe tool again. And I'm also completely open to people messaging me and asking questions. Mainly, I mean, go through my Instagram, because it's the one I tend to be on most, um, Facebook doesn't always tell me I've got a message. Um, but yeah, if you ever have any questions about anything, then feel free to send me a message. So I have just used that tool there, gently rocking it over and created a waffle effect. Again, you could use a mold for that if you wanted to, but I have enough cake decorating tools already that I don't need any more in my house. So let's get some more white. I'm now going to be doing the ice cream, little swirl of ice cream on top. You can also use this technique for doing a swirl of buttercream as well. Or if you're doing, I've done a cake where I pretended I'd piped kind of swirls on top with the modelling paste. And it's exactly the same technique that I use. So you're just building a swirl shape. Oh, you can also use it snails as well. It looks quite cool for the shell. <laughs> buttercream ice cream and snails yeah mm. what a tasty mix that is <clears throat> so you want a piece of whatever color you're going to be doing the alternative swirl in so you've got the pink here and then a piece of white the same size Go like that again roll that up I have no muscles anywhere in my body, but I bet you if they ever did a test, round here would probably be, I'd be like the Hulk. I think your fingers would be extremely strong. The amount of kneading you've had to do. Yes, I mean, I do find as well my skin gets really sore from doing that, especially when the icing's hard. So I'm just using kind of a karate chop motion. So again, I've got that hand tense as hard as I can get it. And then I'm using that section of my hand there and just rocking it back and forth. Quite hard to show this whenever I teach it. Rock it back and forth until I've got a point at that end. Turn it round and then back and forth. So I'm going taking that the whole way across my palm. And then I'm leaving that bit in the middle there until they're roughly the same. And then I'm going to join those two together. And then back in my palm, and I'm just going to roll the whole thing just to make it into one piece of paste because you don't want a groove line going down the centre that's too deep. And then I'm going to twist that. So we now have kind of a swirly, stripy, weird thing. I wouldn't even know what to describe that as. And I'm going to start twisting that. So that little bit there is going to be hidden. That's going to be at the base, so I don't really need to worry about that. And then start pulling this up and around. So I'll show you from a different angle there. Twist it and then pop that on the top and then you have your little cake swirl or ice cream swirl in this case. And then I'm just going to stick that on. So I've not had to use glue because this paste is quite soft. I prefer not to use glue if I can get away with it because when you do use glue, like it is, it's going to kind of seep out somewhere and ruin it. So it's nicer to just not use it if you can. One of the big things that I've found with people with cake decorating is the amount of glue they use. They get really overexcited and decide that they want to use all the glue. 
and it doesn't dry and disappear it's always going to be there so try and limit that particularly when you're entering competitions because that is one of the things the judges will look out for look at you individual sprinkles that is dedication it is all madness rose i'm i'm gonna say a little bit both (laughs) i like to think there's a little bit of madness in cake decorating as you say we stay up late so i can say that with confidence (laughs) it's not true everybody it's true i'm completely sane true not at all I'm just sticking those on and I'm using the glue brush just to lift them as well otherwise I would be there forever trying to pick those up with my fingers or using like a, um, tweezers or something oh I'm going to need to use a little bit of glue cool. so that just... is our little ice cream cone so it's a bit of a chocolate cone that one is actually move those out of the way for now and then we are on to our yummy ice lolly. So I am very excited to be involved in Cakeology this year. Have you been before, Rose? Or? I have, and I I was right. I have had the most amazing time at Cakeology. I was so looking forward to it this year. I kind of think that, you know, we're all in the same boat. So this is, this is you know, us doing the best that we can. And I hope yeah. that it's a nice little change to get into people's houses. But I cannot wait to be back next year. So... Fingers crossed we get through this and we can be doing it in person next year. Yes, it was the most amazing show, amazing people. It's an incredible weekend, actually. And, of course, there's the um, Indian Cake Awards as well. So That's between the two of them, it was the highlight of my, li- my year last year. Absolutely. And I got to wear a sari. And I got to dance. I think and I got saw to that. Sing. Yeah. Thank yeah. You Are you in the sari? I- I am very surprised that Bollywood did not contact me afterwards. It has, <laughs> that was a, a huge disappointment to me, but I'm, oh, Rose, I'm, I'm trying to be bigger than that. <laughs> so I'm just adding quite a liberal amount of glue on there because I want the sprinkles to stick. I would absolutely love to go. I, I love the Indian culture, all the colours. I mean, this to me is, is quite bright, but in India, all the beautiful jewel colours and stuff that they have. The colours are amazing. The people are amazing. The weather was insane. I have never seen so much rain in my life, and I live in the north of England. That is how much rain there was. But it, it does <laughs> rain there then. <laughs> Yeah, with these horrible weather conditions too. Oh, that's the wrong colour. It was warm rain though, so it, I'm going to say it's better. It, they have better rain over there. Okay, you can go out and have a shower in it. <laughs> Multi-purpose rain. Go out, get wet, wash your hair. I'm just rolling a little sausage of the um, autumn leaf colour. That's the colour I don't know if I said that I used for the baked goods earlier. I'm like I work for Tesco's now, don't I? Baked goods. Right, I'm just making a hole in the bottom there. A little bit of glue in. Sorry, I, I freely admit I do get really messy when I work. I am not the tidiest of workers. I wait until my desk is just completely um, like covered in stuff, and then I'll be like, oh, I'll tidy it up now, because I can't possibly work without it. Right. So, is that everything? That is all of our little models done there. So, I am now going to get out the red dust, get our um, watermelon little bit of colour. Again, this is another sugar flare colour. This one is ruby. Nice deep red colour. Great for lips. Is it? I like ruby, yeah. I get really scared about painting faces in two dark colours, so I get stuck on the dusky pink colour. That's kind of the only one I use. You like the natural look. Yeah, otherwise I just think I'm going to end up making her look just completely overdone. So because this is quite a dark colour, I don't want to go in too nuts, and I also don't want to cover the middle of it at all, so I want just the outside to be shaded. just adds that little bit more definition 
This is another thing as well with um, if you're entering competitions, the more skills that you can show and dusting will be classed as a skill, the better. So if you are good at something, try and include it in your piece. Okay, that's those dusted, so a little bit darker, and I now have red hands. Make sure you wash your hands off after you've used dust, because it will transfer to everything. And make sure as well you look at your tools, because the last thing you want to do is have got some dust on your hands, then onto your tools. I've done that before, and then gone to use the tool and ended up smearing a dark colour all over something. Every single time. Yeah. How to ruin your beautiful model that like you spent half an hour on in, in three seconds. So I'm just dusting in those little waffle lines that I created earlier just to enhance them. Definitely is a chocolate cone, that one. If you did it from a lighter shade, then I would use the cream colouring like we did um, earlier. And then a little bit more of the cream. Just gives that a little bit of colour there. So you don't want to go over the whole thing. You want to leave some of the paste in the original colour and then some of it you want to add a little bit of dark colour to. I'm going to get rid of that before I end up colouring everything. Right, so we've got our yellow, egg yellow coloured paste, which is my favourite yellow. Such a nice warm shade. I find quite a lot of the yellows are kind of greeny, whereas this one's a really nice warm colour. Just rolling that out fairly thinly. If you really like the taste of icing, you can have it a bit thicker. So we're about two millimetres thick. And then I'm going to use my circle cutters just to cut those out. You can use pastry cutters as well. The thing I love about all of this is you can do all of it in advance. There's yes, no definitely dry cupcake but you don't want to have to be doing these at the last minute so nope. having them ready before your cupcake is perfect it is and you, all you have to do is just i tend to get the cupcake boxes um that i was going to use for the cupcakes out and then just pop the toppers in there until i need them so they're just sitting ready to go dust and heat are the only things that are going to ruin them so as long as you look after them nicely put them in a nice like dry cupboard then they'll be ready Especially when you've got an order for, say, 200 cupcakes. You don't really want to be doing these last minute. And if I did have, I mean, I don't create cakes for customers anymore, but if I did have an order, like a large order, I would try and do some filler cupcakes as well so that I wasn't spending all of my time making, say, 200 of these. I would do just some buttercream swells with maybe the sprinkles on just to tie them in, but they wouldn't take me any time and they'd make me a little bit more money. I'm just using kind of a medium tool and a small ball there just to kind of add some little dimples. The, the, uh, I was going to say grass then. Yes, that's grass, obviously. And then I'm going to start sticking on my toppers. So I'd need to leave these discs for at least overnight just so they'd set. Because if we try and pick them up now, they're just going to flop, especially with the toppers on because they're obviously going to be quite heavy. So you need to leave them overnight, and then once they've set, pop them onto your buttercreamed cupcake, and you are ready to go. There we go. Burger. We've got the burger, the hot dog, the ice cream, the lollipop, the melon, and the donut. Only one. Only one, because I ate the rest. Because you ate the rest. Yeah. Um, and we have our little perfect teeny weeny miniature cupcake toppers with added advice for anybody who's going to enter the cakeology competition cannot say fairer than that can we vicky tether thank you so much give us the name of your book again oh here we go so it's making sugar models it's called does it say your name on there it does at the bottom oh, there. there we go vicky yeah. tether from the yellow bee cake company yeah, uh, Vicky, thank you so much. I'm going to give you a big round of applause. It's just me, but it's actually <laughs> everybody. Well done, Vicky Tether. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Cakeology, and I really hope you enjoy the show.
we have got a little bit of fun for you at the moment. We're going to go over to Nitin Mirani, who's got a fun quiz, which we're calling Fake It or Bake It. Let's see if you can spot the imposter. Not Nitin, Nitin's not an imposter. We've got the cakes that are. <laughs> Hi everyone, this is Nitin Mirani and I welcome you to Bake Laughs brought to you by Cakeology 2020. Um, as you already know, we're trying our best to keep this nice and interactive for all you people and all you amazing bakers and uh, everybody involved in baking something or the other. Uh, we actually had a very, very fun uh, uh, quiz that we played with a few selected people. It was called Bake It or Fake It, where you had to decide whether the product or the, or the cake we're showing you is actually a real thing or is it a cake you know so simple as that it's either you bake it or you fake it and we actually had a few people who played with us uh, they were selected and the names were Ruchi Gupta we had Ruchi uh, we had Sharon Pires uh, we had Gauri Kekre and we had uh, Pinkle Satsdev and the winner for that quiz was actually Gauri Kekre so Gauri uh, big round of applause to you one more time for participating and uh, winning uh, this quiz and then we decided that why not uh, we play the same quiz with you guys and give you a chance to win prizes as well so all you got to do right now is we're going to show you some photographs and you have to tell us whether uh, you can bake it or you can fake it it's as simple as that what you need to do is just type down the answers in the chat uh, you're going you're gonna to be given 10 seconds after i show you every photograph and the fastest uh, person who types the answer and the correct answer and the person with the most number of answers is going to walk away with a prize because that's how amazing we are so i hope you guys are ready let's kick off our segment of fake it or bake it all right everyone i hope you're ready and you have your fingers ready because you got to type really fast so let's actually move on to our first image and like I said, I'm going to repeat myself once again. You have 10 seconds to give us the right answer. And the person who uh, types the fastest and the person with the most number of answers is actually going to get a very, very special prize courtesy Cakeology, Cake Fest and Beyond 2020. All right, so let's begin with our first image, which is right here. This is the kind of bag that I'll definitely try to get one for myself. But what you need to tell me is that, is this a real object, a proper bag, or is it a cake? You have 10 seconds. Well, I don't know how many of you got the answer right, but this is actually a very, very delicious cake. As you can see, uh, you have uh, you can see the image right now. They've cut the bag into half and uh, it looks so yummy right now. So uh, I hope some of you got that one right. Let's move on to our next image, which is this one. Ooh, that looks like a tough one, actually. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure you guys are confused, but uh, feel free to zoom in. Uh, zoom in as much as you can because you will need all that zooming in to figure out whether this is an actual book or is it a cake. And the answer is, it is actually a book. And I'm so glad uh, some of you people didn't try to cut this book into half because that would be a very, very sad birthday party. All right, moving on to our next object, or cake. Ah, this is something I've seen lying around in my kitchen all the time because that's the only thing I know how to do. It just cut a lemon into half. Uh, but uh, you need to tell me right now if this is a cake uh, is it a lemon cake or is it an actual lemon? And the answer is it is actually a lemon cake and a big, big congratulations for whoever made this because it is so accurate. And uh, I don't know about you, but it's looking like it's, I want to have a lemon cake right now. Moving on to our next slide which is now you need to tell me if this is actually a cake or it is just a shoe somebody left behind i think the brand is doc martens yeah one of my favorite brands 
So you need to tell me if this is actually a cake or it is just a shoe. Well, this is an absolute cake right there. Uh, honestly, I don't know how somebody would, uh, um, you know, order a cake like this. But in Hindi, we, we say that uh, it, this gives jute khana only meaning. So, if you jute khane, hai, I think make sure your juta is so uh, delicious like this one. Wow, the the uh, thing is really really accurate. The detail is actually quite quite accurate. So, well done. How are you guys doing? I hope you guys are doing well. Are you getting some questions or some answers right? This is our next one. Uh, and uh, this looks like a bag. And I'm pretty sure some of the ladies are definitely excited to see this one. Uh, it's a nice looking bag actually. But you need to tell me if this is a bag or is it something that you can cut into half and consume. Again, the detail is very accurate. Well, the detail is absolutely accurate because it is not a cake. It is actually a purse. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure the purse is nice looking. So you can put a cupcake inside it. But uh, this is actually a purse. Moving on to our next one. Looks like a piece of wood to me or a small log. Uh, but you need to tell me within 10 seconds if this is a cake or it is just a piece of log, piece of wood. And this is actually a cake. I have no idea who would want to order a cake like this. It's a very interesting choice of cake where you just have a piece of log that looks like a cake. Or you can just make it and then have it yourself because you don't want people to know that there is cake lying around. Moving on to our next one. Uh, I'm not a big fan of vegetables myself. I don't know if you guys are. Uh, but uh, cauliflower, this is a nice looking cauliflower. I've seen cauliflowers in my life, but this is quite nice looking. Uh, actually confuses me whether it's a real cauliflower or is it a cake uh, yeah it would be very interesting for somebody to get a cake that looks like this so personally i have no idea myself so let's find out and this is actually a cauliflower thank god because uh, it would be very weird cutting a cauliflower and having chocolate coming out of it but uh, you know there you go that's the real thing our next one is, uh, oh my God, this is something that I have grown up on, a packet of Doritos and my favorite flavor actually, it's nacho cheese. Uh, so you need to tell me if this is an actual packet that's lying around before the party, of course, because after the party would be empty or this is an actual cake. Ladies and gentlemen, and the answer is it is actually a cake and wow, what an amazing cake. They've got every detail down to the T. As you can see, they've actually put uh, the weight and the expiry date and everything and, uh, and the gloss is perfect. Uh, but wow, I mean, you know, you have to be a Dorito lover to get a cake like this. Moving on to our next one. A very, very popular choice uh, for children, uh, mostly found in bathtubs. Uh, and people uh, and children really enjoy uh, uh, these little toys and I think people love gifting this toy to little children but you need to tell me right now if this is a cake for a one or two year old or is it just a rubber duck and the answer is it is a rubber duck thank god because if it was a cake and it goes into the tub that's going to be a very very messy shower right there moving on to our next one just a roll of yarn, simple, nice looking. Uh, there you go. You can have a look at it. Please feel free to zoom in. You've got 10 seconds. And tell me if this is an actual uh, yarn, a premium yarn, or is it a cake? And the answer for this one is it is actually a cake. Uh, Amazing, amazing detail on this cake as well. Uh, so well done for whoever has got the answer right and whoever's made this. Fantastic. Moving on to our next one. Wow. Uh, well, I should have put a disclaimer on this one. People who are scared of snakes, please cover your eyes. Uh, this is a python. Actually, I don't know which python is it, but it's actually a python. You've got 10 seconds to tell me um, whether this is an actual uh, 
python which means whether this will eat you or you will eat this uh, i mean if you're from china then <laughs> both things work but i'm talking about the fact that it might be a cake and the answer for this one is uh, i am equally shocked as you are oh my god this is actually a cake i have no idea who would order a cake like this but i can tell you one thing that this is a cake for his and hers both all right moving on to our last one for this quiz uh, just just a can of sparkling water uh, white claw very very popular brand as well um, and you need to tell me if this is something that will uh, uh, actually quench your thirst or uh, fill up your appetite so is this a fake or is it a cake And the answer for this one is it is actually a cake. Uh, wow, fantastic. Personally, I would have gone for a, for a can of Heineken, but just to know that you can, uh, you know, get cakes made like these um, is quite exciting for me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to the end of the quiz, uh, which is fake it or bake it. And uh, right now we're going to be uh, very soon coming up with who the winner for this quiz is uh, the fun thing about this quiz is you're sitting at home and you're just chilling and answering the quiz uh, very soon we're going to be announcing uh, who the winner for this one is and uh, yeah we're going to make sure that we're going to hang around and keep it very very interactive for you right here at cakeology cake and beyond fest 2020 my name is nitin mirani and i'll see you soon So exciting. We have a little opportunity to talk to Chef Attic from Bakersville, an amazing company that at last year's Cakeology had 600, over 600 cakes on display as part of the Guinness World Record attempt, at which you got Chef Attic, welcome and hello from Bakersville. Thank you. So um, we're, we're going to miss you this year. We really are. But tell everybody a little bit about the journey so far for Bakersville. Yeah, sure. So I will show you the journey of Bakersville. Eh? So this, it has uh, been nine years for uh, data from a Bakersville, like Bakersville India Private Limited journey from 2011. The journey has been full of learning, exciting and continuous progress. Starting the dealership, yes, the starting the dealership operation from three cities of India, three cities like company has got its progress in all over India and it has a distribution chain of 185 distributors all over India. And you have a really big presence at Cakeology as well. Uh, what do you yeah. think are the business opportunities for home bakers? Yes, so we are presence all over India. We are presence all over India and we have a distribution change of 185. And if we talk about our product strength, then we have a product strength of 5,000 products in our Bakersville India Private Limited. And this product has a very huge production, like basically we are 500, 5,000 products in our baskets. Uh, you know, I'm honestly disappointed not to be seeing you in person this year. This is the next best thing. Um, thank you for joining us. And I really hope to see you next year, Chef Attic. Will Bakersfield yeah. be back with Cakeology? Yes. to announce some more competition winners. This time, our junior category. So these are our Cakeology Artists of the Future. Don't forget, we've still got to announce our best in show, and that will happen at the end of the show. But in the meantime, for the junior category, over to our head judge, Chef Nicholas. 
Hi everybody, I'm back again for the last uh, but fun part of the competition, which is the junior category. So we had two age groups in that category. One was 10 to 12 years old, and the second is 13 to 15 years. Let's start with the younger ones first, the 10 to 12 year old category. We saw such cute, adorable entries, and it's nice to see upcoming budding cake artists of the future. We had seven entries that would get a certificate of merit um, in this division because the quality and level of standard was so high. So here we go and let's see what they've done. Let's start with the third place winner, Anushka Neheshwari. Congratulations. Would you like to say a few words? This is Anushka Maheshwari from Chennai, India. Thank you for Chef Nicholas and the Kekiology for having this competition. I am so excited that I won. So the second place winner is Ashi Chawande. So congratulations. Could you say a few words, please? Hi, I'm Ashia Mitchavande from Khamga. Thank you, Chef Nicholas and Kekology to have this online competition. I'm so excited to have one in it or I can't believe I have one. And the first place winner is Kritika Charasia. Congratulations. Like to come up on stage and say a few words. Hi everyone, I am Kritika Chaurasia from Bangalore, India. Thank you Chef Nicholas and Kekalogy for having this online competition. So congratulations to all of the uh, obviously 10 to 12 year category. We wanted to give everybody a prize. They're also adorable but I said uh, good luck in, in your future and your budding career as a cake artist. So congratulations to all of those. So the last category left is the juniors. That's the 13 to 15 year age group. We have actually four additional entries who will receive a certificate of merit. So let's see who these are first. So now we move on to the third place winner is going to be Hashid Birkam Goel. Congratulations. So if you'd like to come up on stage and give us a few words. Hi, I am Hashid Birkam Goel from Jagadri Haryana. Thank you Chef Nicholas and Kekology for having this online competition. I'm really happy that I have won. The second place winner is Themashi Vyanga. Please come up on stage, congratulations. Hi, I am Timasha Vihanga from Sri Lanka. Thank you, Jeff Nicholas and Kekology for having this online competition. I can't believe I have won. And the first place winner, in the junior 13 to 15 year old category is a young pal. So congratulations to Ayan. So if you'd like to come up on stage if you say a few words. Hi everyone, I am Ayan Pal from Kolkata. Thank you Chef Nicholas Lodge and Kekology for having this online competition. I can't believe that I have won. This was my first entry to a competition. Thank you so much once again. And now what a treat over to our last demo of the day. None other than Sydney Galpin from the USA. And she's going to be doing some isomalt genius on screen. Stay with us.
Hi guys, I'm Sydney Galpern from cmecakes.com and I'm so excited to be here today to show you how to make this elegant isomalt water lily sculpture. So I'm gonna be showing you how to make this whole thing out of cast and cold hand sculpted isomalt technique. Sydney Galpern is in the house, Sydney, hello. <laughs> hello, oh, isomalt rocks ready to go. We're making the lily, right? We're making a water lily. A water lily. That was that was a really bad American accent. Please excuse me. Um, Sydney, you are amazing. You're so young and yet you're so accomplished. And we're going to learn all your secrets today, aren't we? Exactly. I'm going to show you everything to do with ice malt. This is an awesome project for beginners. Or if you've already worked with ice malt before, it is going to be perfect. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. We've got loads of time to talk as well. So show us what you're going to do. You're starting with your ice malt. Yes, yeah, so I have my ice malt here that's pre-cooked. So I have a brand of ice malt here um, that is my brand of pre-cooked ice malt. And you can get pre-cooked ice malt where it's already in this hard candy form. That's going to be the easiest to work with. So that's what I'm doing today. But you can temper ice malt from a raw form, which is a powder. So if you prefer um, or if that's what you have, you can temper the raw ice malt. It's kind of similar to tempering chocolate. So I'm not going to um, you know, be doing that today just because it's about 45 minutes of stirring a pot. And that would be a very boring 45 minute demo for you guys. So that's why we're starting with it already pre-tempered. But if anybody's interested in tempering raw ice malt, I do have my recipe listed on my website for free. But basically because this is already pre-cooked, it's already gone through that whole tempering process and it's gonna work super, super easy. So ice malt is basically a sugar-free hard candy. So it is made from beets. It's a byproduct of beet sugar. It's 100% edible and it's completely sugar-free. So it's safe for anyone who can't have sugar, which is really, really nice. And it's gonna work a lot better and a lot easier for you than traditional boiled sugar. So any of the techniques that you can do with boiled sugar, you can do with ice milk and it holds up a lot better. It's gonna last longer in humidity. It's gonna be a lot stronger and clearer. So that is what I'm using today. So basically what we're going to do, because this is already tempered, it's already come to the right temperatures and everything, we're just going to melt it down. So I'm taking the uh, ice malt tiles and I'm melting them down in the microwave for 30 seconds and then 15 second intervals. So I have a bowl popped in the microwave that was preheating behind me. So I'm just going to grab that and it needs a little bit more time. So I'm just going to pop it back into the microwave. If you prefer to work over the stove, that's totally fine. You can just start it low and slowly bring the temperature up until it's a liquid. Again, because I am working with tempered ice milk already, I'm not worrying about temperatures or recipes or anything. It's going to be super easy. You just melt it and go. Now, you do have to be very careful because ice milk is very, very hot. It's about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So I do recommend wearing gloves uh, to protect your hands, usually a cotton glove. And then like a nitrile or latex glove over top of that will buffer the heat from your hands. But it is quite hot. So I do recommend wearing those gloves, not following my bad example and not wearing gloves. I've been working with this for about 13 years and my hands have no heat sensitivity left. So it's easier for me to demonstrate without the gloves. But I do recommend my students wear them. That's not even a joke though, is it? You really do have asbestos hands. Yes, I really do. <laughs> You say you've been doing it for 13 years, Sydney. Yes. Look, everybody, how old you are, because if there were a child yeah. prodigy in Isomalt, it is Sydney Galpin, right? How old are you now? I am 24 now, so I started. No, when I I'm only 24 now. That's how we say yeah. I'm only 24. You're a little baby, and you are the top of your game. You are oh. the king of Isomalt. Um, <laughs> If you can do it at such a young age, and what what age were you when you started? I was about 12 when I started. What is that? That's just, I'm just going to go now. That's a, annoying. Annoying. No, I started early, but ice is really amazing. I mean, a lot of the time, ice malt, at least in the past, has made, been made out to be very, very intimidating, and you need all this special training, and only pastry chefs can do it. But ice malt is such a good tool in your kitchen, whether you're an at-home baker, whether you have a, you're in a bakery setting where time is money and you want something efficient, and it's so versatile. There's so many things you can do with it, from pouring it to pulling it and hand sculpting it to actually doing the blown sugar techniques with it. And there's just a, so many different things that you can do with ice malt that I was just amazed by it from the start. So it is my absolute favorite medium. So that's the melted, that's the melted ice malt. Exactly. So I melted it. In you, now, you have to excuse me for asking stupid questions, but I think I, like a lot of people, am not very good with ice malt at all. Can you overheat the ice malt? 
Yeah, um, you can overheat the ice malt, and there's no stupid questions, so don't worry about that. It's good to ask questions because that's the best way to learn. But um, you can overheat the ice malt, but it's going to be a lot harder to overheat than traditional sugar. So it has a much higher burning and yellowing temperature before it starts to caramelize. So that's why I recommend just that 30 seconds and then 15 second intervals. But you um, want to make sure that you just go in small increments just in case. Um, but generally, as long as you stick to those very small increments, you won't have any problem. Okay. So I have the liquid ice melt here. Like I said, it is about 300 degrees Fahrenheit right now, which is very, very hot. So I am being careful. But at this point, while it's liquid, I want to add in some color. So I'm going to add in an edible airbrush color. So I'm going to be making a base first for my water lily to sit on, just a little water base. So I'm going to be uh, dyeing this blue with some blue airbrush color. So this is a water base, but you can also use an alcohol-based color. This is a sky blue. I'm just going to add a couple drops into it. Now you can use airbrush color. You can also use powdered colors, so like petal dust and luster dust, but you never ever want to mix in gel color. Gel color, the gelatin in it will break down the ice malt and it will not dry properly. It will uh, just cause everything to kind of fall over and slump. So that's why the water or the alcohol is going to be best. And you can see it colors it really beautifully and very quickly. That was only three drops and it just gives you that perfect color. Okay. Jim, what boom right there is you've explained something that I know I've done wrong in the past because you assume that when you use gel colour for lots of sugar pastes and things that we might be used to, that's yeah. what they recommend, but not yeah. yeah? Exactly, yeah. So the uh, liquid is really going to work the best. And that's the thing with ice malt. It's really all about the little tips and tricks. Once you get those little tips, it makes so much of a difference and it just makes everything super easy. I think that ice malt should be a standard medium in every kitchen because it's just, there's so much you can do with it. It dries so quickly and uh, yeah, it just makes it super easy. So that liquid color is going to be the best. You can also add powders, but the powder is going to give you an opaque finish where this made a nice glassy clear color. Powder colors are going to give you more of a solid, okay finish, and I'm going to be using a little bit of those later, so I'll show you the difference. Um, and then at this point, you can also mix in flavoring. So I use oil-based flavorings, and the oil-based flavorings are going to be really concentrated. You can mix those in as soon as the ice melts melted. Don't taste test it while it's liquid. <laughs> Just because it is very hot, pour a little mold or dribble some out and let it cool before you taste it if you want. But I like to use an oil-based rather than like an emulsion or an extract because they're not going to be as concentrated. And you don't want to add too much uh, excess liquid into the ice malt because it can affect the texture. So I am just popping my ice malt back into the microwave after I mixed it because one of the most common questions I get when working with ice malt is how do you remove bubbles? So removing bubbles is going to be uh, through a couple of different tips and different techniques, the main thing is going to be bringing it to a boil in the microwave and then letting it settle. So when I melt my ice malt, I never stir it. That's another thing is you never, ever want to stir the ice malt because stirring it is just turning in air. It's not like chocolate that needs that agitation in order to heat evenly. Ice malt will just do its thing in the microwave and it will be perfect. So I just bring it to a boil, which it is right now. Okay, and hot air rises. So any air that I did mix in because I had to stir it to mix in my color or your flavorings uh, is going to rise and pop itself. It's all going to boil itself out. So after I take it out of the microwave and it's at a boil, I'm going to let it settle. So I'm going to let it calm down, let all that air rise out. And after about a minute or two at room temperature, all of that air is going to be gone and I can go ahead and pour it. Okay. So I'll just set this guy. You can already see he's calmed down a pretty good amount. I'm just going to give it another minute. And then I'm going to grab the mat I'm going to be pouring on. Okay. So this is, I'm working on a Silpat silicone mat, um, which is fine to work on, but I don't really like pouring right onto these because silicone can bubble up from heat and your pieces can get like a wavy underneath. So I'm using a thin uh, coated Teflon mat. So this is just like a, a baking liner mat. And so I'm just going to pour right on there because it's a little bit more lightweight and the ice mold can hold it down flat and make nice, beautiful pieces. So to make our base, I'm just gonna do kind of an abstract water effect. I'm just gonna pour a puddle. Of course, you can pour into a mold if you want to. You can pour into greased foil. So if you didn't have this mat, you can just take a piece of aluminum foil and grease it with some cooking spray and just wipe, kind of wipe it down with paper towel to make sure it's all spread out. And then you can just uh, pour it on there and let it cool and it will remove as long as you grease the metal aluminum foil. Uh, with this, it's coated, so I don't have to, but uh, this is what I like to use just because it's reusable, so it makes it easy. 
Um, you could also pour, if you wanted more of an exact shape, you can pour it inside a metal cake pan. So let's say your cake topper that you're using this uh, for, the top tier is a six inch cake. That same pan, after you wash it, of course, can be greased with cooking spray and you can pour the ice mold in there to create a plaque or a base. And you can also do the same thing with metal cookie cutters and lay them on top of this kind of mat or an aluminum foil too. So you have lots of different options with things that you probably already have in your kitchen as far as forming your base. Okay. So I am just going to, now that my ice mold has settled, there may be one or two bubbles sitting there, but they will, I'll be able to pop those afterwards. So I'm not gonna worry about them. I'm just going to pour my base onto my mat. So I'm gonna pour a, just a free form shape. And it may collect some bubbles along the bottom, but that's okay, I don't mind. And so I'm just kind of pouring, it's supposed to look like water, so I'm not worrying about it being too perfect. And I'm just kind of pouring an abstract shape here and we can add a little bit more texture and things to it later. Perfect. Okay, so that looks just like a big water splash, right? So it's perfect. I don't have to do anything else to it as far as shape. There is one little bubble that I see sitting on the top here. I'm gonna just pop that with the torch before it sets up all the way. Um, so I'm just lightly going to torch over the surface. You can see that little bubble just popped away. And any of those little bubbles um, that I can see underneath the ice mold that are sticking to the mat, I'll get those away later. So I'm not gonna worry about those. Or potentially, I mean, this is water, you could leave them, but I'll probably clear some of them away just to give a nice glassy finish. And that's it. All we have to do now is just let this cool and we're going to peel it off of the mat in about 15 to 20 minutes, depending on the temperature of your room. You just wanna let it set at room temperature. So we'll set this guy off to the side while we pour some other pieces. I'm probably going to move this guy off to the side here so he's out of my way. Sydney, does the temperature of your room matter? Does it? Is this one of those products that it changes what you have to do with it in hot and cold temperatures? Yes, temperature is a factor when working with ice malt. It's not going to be, um, ice malt is a lot less temperamental. I'm just popping another bowl here in the microwave. Uh, ice mold is a lot less temperamental than traditional boiled sugar, but it is very temperature sensitive. So if you're in a very, very cold room, it's not going to have as long to set up. If you're in a warm room, it may not set up all the way or it could take longer. So um, here I usually keep my room in uh, like 70 degrees Fahrenheit area um, between 70 and maybe 78 here. Um, again, that's Fahrenheit and that just is going to be a nice cool room temperature. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. Um, I do specifically with my recipe when I temper the ice mold, I do make sure that it dry, is going to dry very slowly because when you initially cook this from a raw powder, the higher temperature you cook it to, the faster this is going to dry. So uh, I do cook this to a very low temperature in order for it to have a lot of time. You can see still it's very, very liquidy. I'm not having to rush or worry about too much, but the nice part about ice mold is you can always remelt it. So if it does cool down too much, all you have to do is pop it back in the microwave. There's no limit to how many times you can remelt it. So did you say the higher you heat it, the, the quicker it cools? Yes, correct. Okay. All right, so the next thing that I'm gonna do is make a little lily pad for my water lily to sit on. So I have one of my molds here. So this is uh, one of my line of molds, a see me mold, but you can use any silicone mold as long as it's high heat and as long as it's food safe, of course, you can use uh, that kind of mold. You don't have to grease it. You don't have to powder it or prep it in any way. I'm just gonna pour the ice molds right in. So I just heated up a little bit of green ice malt. Okay, I'm gonna pop it for another 30 seconds or so. Okay, and I'm just gonna fill this in and let it cool. So silicone molds are one of the easiest molds to use with ice malt because again, you don't have to prep them with anything. You can also use a hard candy plastic mold. They have to be the hard candy ones though. They can't be like the clear chocolate molds. Those are not high heat. Uh, they will melt because chocolate has a much lower te uh, melting temperature than ice melt. So they have to be generally, they're like the opaque white ones and you do have to grease them as well. But um, you can use either of those with ice melt as well as like I was saying, the metal molds and metal cookie cutters as forms. All right. Yeah, I actually have one here I can show you guys. So this is a hard candy mold. So you can see that it's an opaque white. It does have to be grease. Um, compared to like a chocolate mold, which is the clear mold. And does the grease, when you grease it, does that not affect the surface of the ice mold that you produce? 
It shouldn't, as long as, usually when I grease it, I would spray it and then use a paper towel just to wipe it around to make sure it's a very thin coat. But as long as you don't do too much that it's actually cooling in the mold, it will be fine. Okay, so see how I just melted a little bit of green ice malt. So this one, I just mixed in that same airbrush color, a little bit of green. And I think I put a little bit of yellow in here too, because I like lime greens. And I'm just going to fill that in. So I'm not filling it in all the way to the top because I don't want to make this too thick and chunky. What I like to do instead is to very carefully either tilt the mold or if it has a little more um, texture and dimension like this one and I don't want to risk spilling it, I'm just going to push it around with a silicone tool. You can also use a toothpick or you can use a uh, skewer or anything that you have on hand that won't melt. All right, so see how I just poured that in and then I'm going to lightly take away any of those surface bubbles. And then this one is a little bit smaller than our base, so it's not going to take as long to cool. It'll probably take about 10 minutes or so, so we'll set him off to the side. Okay. I'm going to pop a little bit of my purple in. So this is in an orange bowl, so it's a little bit hard to see right now, but I have a purple color. And we're going to use this for our dragonflies. So we're going to be putting some dragonflies on the finished piece. As you can see, I have two different dragonflies on the mold here that I'll pour as well. Great so, Yeah, so this is basically just casting sugar. It's casting ice malt and pouring into mold. It's super, super easy. Not that much different from working with chocolate. Okay. All right, so while it's melting, I can show you guys the difference. So when I make my petals later, I'm going to be pouring those into a mold as well. So you can see this petal mold here for my water lily. Um, but these, I actually put in a luster dust. So if you see how it has a little bit, I'm trying to get the lighting right so you guys can see, it has some opacity to it. It's not completely see-through. It's kind of milky and a little bit cloudy. I didn't put very much into the ice malt because I still wanted a little bit of translucency, but you can really see the difference between the clear and that bit of shimmer and that opaque finish. And this, I find, just makes your pieces pop more. Since I was doing a white petal, if I were to just do it in clear, sometimes you lose some of the details. So this is just going to reflect the light really, really. So the dust is mixed into the ice mold. You yeah. mix it in. Exactly. And you can also paint ice mold, which I am going to be showing you guys later. I'll talk more about painting. But um, you can also paint the luster dust on top of ice mold really easy as well. Okay. So I'm just taking all these little pieces that are cooling off my um, tool. You can see they just come right off, and I can throw those back in my bowl and remelt them. So there's really no waste with ice mold, which is one of my favorite parts. Anything that, like, let's say you're making a whole bunch of these little dragonflies for cupcakes, if you make too many of them and you don't use them all, or if you make some and you're just practicing and you don't really like how they come out at first as you're just getting a feel for it, you can remelt them. There's so many different ways that you can use it. Or if you're just making showpieces or decorations for cakes, taking a picture of them for your portfolio or your Facebook page, and then melting them back, you can melt them back down afterwards and use that ice melt again. So it's really, really awesome. There's no waste to it. So you can see, I just have my purple here and I'm just letting that settle and then I'll pour it into my molds. While you're doing that, um, one of the things you said that really surprised me was that it's not, there's no sugar at all. Right. So what yeah. is it? What is isomol? It's basically, it's a sugar-free hard candy. So like if you, um, at least here in the States, if you look at like Jolly Ranchers, like the candies, the little hard candies, uh, sugar-free versions of that is going to be isomol. So like pop drops, Things that are a hard candy texture, like an actual hard candy, but they don't want all that additional sugar in it. That's what they would use an ice malt or something similar because it's basically when they make beet sugar, when they extract the sugar from beets, they this is what's left over. This is the byproduct of that. So they take all of the sugar out and you're left with the ice malt. Okay, so I'm just going to pour this into my mold and I'm going to do the same thing here where I'm just going to fill it partially and then use my tool to spread the ice malt into all the little crevices. That's a beautiful color. Isn't that pretty? I put some pink in it too, so it's a little bit more. Oh, there's such girls. I'm a sucker for girl colors. Right, since I'm gonna be doing pink in my water lily on the tips of it later, I wanted it to kind of tie in nicely. Okay, so you can see super, super easy. These are even smaller, so they're only gonna take probably about five to 10 minutes to cool. Another cool thing you can do with these is you can melt um, and pour your ice malt. And then when it's cool, this would take probably about 
like I said, about 10 minutes to cool completely. And that's perfect for dragonflies, which are just flat. I mean, their wings generally when they're laying, you know, sitting on something are just going to be flat. But let's say this was a butterfly or a leaf or a flower or something that you wanted to actually bend and add shape to. You can take this out a little bit early and you can actually bend it. So it's kind of an in-between and it depends on the mold as far as how long that's going to take. It may take some trial and error just to find out depending on the thickness and the temperature of your room. But you can take these out at, let's say with this one, about the five to seven minute mark where it's still going to be warm enough and pliable enough to bend, but it's cool enough to actually hold its shape and hold all the detail that you put in it. So that gives you even more options as far as shaping and bending things to your cake. Okay, so we will set this guy over here. And I'm now going to pour some of my water lily decorations. So this water lily mold that I'm using is uh, one of the kits that we have. So it's actually going to be two molds together. Um, I have the petal molds here. I have a kind of attachment base that we're going to build everything onto. I have my center stamens here that are going to go around our center sphere. So this is just a sphere mold here. And it goes together with a rubber band. And I'm melting a little bit of that ice malt in the microwave. Give it another 30 seconds while I wrap my rubber bands. Okay. So we're going to kind of pour each one of these pieces. Of course, the petals aren't going to take as long to cool as the center sphere. Um, the sphere is going to probably take about 20 minutes or so, whereas the petals will take about 10 minutes. And then the, um, the center disc here will take about that as well. These little stamens are only going to take maybe a minute or two, maybe three minutes until, because we do want to bend these, which I'll show you in just a second. So I'm just heating that ice melt up. I'm so excited about this. I am an absolute novice at stuff like this. And that, to me, looks like mold nirvana. That looks so exciting. Exactly. Yeah, it's just going to make it so easy for you because everything's going to fit together. Everything's going to, you know, match up. And um, we are going to be pouring these. I pre-made some pieces, but we're going to be pouring these a couple of times. So you basically can kind of pour them, let them set, and go do something else, and then come back. And it just makes it super, super efficient. So let's see. I'll start with my petals here. I'm going to pour a little bit in the center, but again, I don't want these too chunky. And I can see that it's not clear, right? It has some of that sheen and that really, really pretty color in it. I'm going to tilt the mold very carefully, but then I'm going to use my tool just to spread it out to the edges so I get nice, thin, delicate petals. Okay, and then again on the other side. And this is going to be more of an abstract water lily. Um, it's going to have that distinct water, those distinct water lily features, but it's going to be a little bit of a fantasy flower as well. Um, as far as, you know, just the way that we put it together, I tend to go more for, you know, like an abstract, like in glass. You know, it may not necessarily be the botanically correct, exact, everything but it's going to have the essence of that water lily and give it a really pretty artistic feel to it that's my style so i'm just going to pour these pieces and total we would use about 15 or so of these petals but i'm going to show you once they cool how we're going to shape them a little bit differently for each row so i'm also going to pour very very carefully we're going to test my skills here and i'm just dripping one by one drips into my little stamen molds as well Look at you with your steady 20-something hands. Might have been all over the table by then. It does take a little practice, and we can help us if you use smaller bowls as well, like a small little silicone bowl, a little pinch bowl. You can also just take your tool and scoop and dip some in or drip some in if you want to, and that will be a lot easier as well. Okay, I'm not worrying about rough edges or anything like that because this is super easy to clean up, which I'll show you when they come out. But we're just going to go ahead and let that cool and fill in our center to cool as well. So I'll fill that guy all the way up to the top, okay, just like that. So like I said, the stamens are only going to take a couple minutes to dry. The other pieces will take a little bit longer. So I wanted to show you guys what I am doing for my center. So I have one that's already made, and I'm going to add some pieces to it so that you can see. But uh, let's see if I can get the lighting right here. So you can see that it is basically our <laughs> white on white here. Our center sphere is in the middle of it. And then I took those stamens, and I just took them out when they're a little bit warm and bent them and wrapped it with a whole bunch of those stamens to create all of the texture in the center. That's so pretty. Isn't that awesome? So it did take a, quite a few of those stamens, but luckily they dry very, very quickly. So um, I did pre-do a couple of these, as you can see most of them. I'm going to put a couple more on just to show you how exactly I did it. 
But um, that is how basically I just kept layering them and layering them until it has that bunch of feel at the top that gives it a whole bunch of mood. Okay, so I'm gonna check on my stamens now. Yep, they should be about good. Always check with the tool, not your finger, just in case. Okay, I'm just going to take these out and I can see that it is kind of bendy so I can still flex it, but it's kind of, I assume it's gonna cool unevenly. The edges are gonna cool faster. Plus I had some rough edges. So I'm gonna take my torch and just reheat this whole thing. Just For little. normal people, was that hot when you touched it? It's going to be much, much cooler. So I still recommend gloves just because you're still handling the torch and things, but it's really not, it's just warm right now. It's not gonna actually burn you if you touch it at this stage. Oops. These pieces are still liquid, so those I'm not gonna touch for a while. Okay, now I'm just letting those cool before I touch them because you did just blow torch it. You don't wanna touch something that you just blow torch. And then I'm just going to kind of smooth and roll and make sure that that is all looking good. And then all I'm gonna do is while it's warm, just attach it onto my center. And it's as easy as that. So you see how I just kind of stuck it on there. I know the lighting, there we go. It's a little funky, but you see how I just laid it up and onto that centerpiece. And that's really it. If it doesn't quite stick like this one isn't, just because I pre-made these, I put a glaze over them to keep them shiny. But you can torch and then just wrap your pieces around. Okay, so I'll do the same with this one. Just make sure it's in a nice shape. Oh, do you know, I'm, I, I want to play now. I think everyone at home is Googling blowtorch. We want to play now. Exactly. It's just a chef's blowtorch. Super, super easy. You see how they're pliable? So I just snipped off the ends so that they kind of matched in a little bit better. And if it looks a little bit rough and cut right at that top, I can just smooth it over with the torch. And it'll just go to a nice, round, smooth end. Easy as that. Okay, so that is basically how I did my center. I just did that about 20 additional times. I just kept making them and making them and covered it up so I couldn't see the sphere anymore in the center. And let's go ahead and check on our pieces here now. Okay, that should be just about good. Sometimes what I'll do is I will take a little battery operated fan and you can just use um, that to cool it down. I never wanna put my pieces in the fridge or the freezer or anything like that, just because the moisture and the condensation can affect them. But this little fan works really good if you're a patient like me, just to cool stuff down. Okay. So again, it's kind of about practicing and finding that in between, that happy medium, when these are gonna be warm enough to bend, but cool enough to hold their shape and not just collapse, which I think is just about now. There we go. So you can see it easily fell out of the mold. If it was still sticking, I would know that it's not ready. And I have my petal. Now I can see that there's some rough edges on it. So I am going to torch those away and just to warm up the edges again so that they don't crack while I bend them. So to do that, I'm going to put this face down. So I'm going to put all the texture of the mold down so that when I torch over it, it doesn't just melt and smooth that over. So I'm putting it face down just like it was in the mold on the silicone mat and then just lightly torching the edges and a little bit in the center just to keep it nice and warm. I'll do that same thing. This guy. Oh, now I'm jealous. I so want to play. <laughs> All right, there we go. So see how I just gave that about 10 seconds while I was working on the other one? And now it's completely smoothed over. So there's no trimming, there's no cutting. It just makes it super easy. And then I'm just going to bend these to give them a little bit of shape. Oh, how satisfying is that to watch? Exactly. It's so quick. You can see if you're at a bakery setting where time is money, this is so efficient and it's really not going to take you much time. Um, of course, it depends on where you are, but like here in Florida, where it's very, very humid, it can take up to a week for fondant and gum paste to dry. So if I was making this out of gum paste, I have to make it a week in advance where this one, I can make it at the last minute. I can make it the day before or a couple of days before if I have the edible glaze to seal it. And it just makes it super, super easy. All right, so I'm just bending these, and depending on which row I'm doing, I'm going to bend them a little bit more or a little bit less. So what I mean by that is when we go to assemble all of our pieces, we're going to do three layers of five petals each. So the outer layer is going to be the mo most flat. So as far as bending, I'm not going to bend them too much. They're going to be a lot flatter. So you can see on the petals that I pre-made here, this is one of my outer petals. So it's just a very slight curve nothing too much, and it's the whole entire petal. Once we start building up, 
I'm going to make my petals a little bit curled as they go towards the center, like it's opening and blooming. And I'm also gonna make them a little shorter. So my next layer of petals, you can see, is a little bit more, this guy here, curved. So you see how it has a slight more curve to it. And I also heat it up and cut about a fourth of the petal off so that when I attach it in, it's going to sit slightly closer to the center. And then for the very, very center one, we're gonna do that same thing, but even more. So this is gonna be my very center layer, my third layer compared to the first one. So you can see it's more curved, and I also cut off some more, maybe about a third to a half of that petal. So I have my three layers here, and that's gonna give us a really beautiful blooming effect. Okay. So to do that, just so I'll show you how I cut those petals, because right now when these are cool, they're completely hard. They're back to like a lollipop or a hard candy form. So to do that, I'm just going to pick out wherever I wanna cut, I'm going to take my torch and I'm going to heat along that line and you can heat a little bit on the back as well. So it's even, give it about 10 seconds for the heat to sink in and you see how it's already bending, right? It's already kind of flopping and it's soft enough to cut right through. So it's really, really easy once you heat it. You don't want to try and cut it without heating it because then it could crack. Okay. All right. So our center should be cool as well. Take that guy out. Yep. That's perfect. And now we can put our flower together. So I'll just go ahead and grab all of our petals. So I have some of these are the small ones. These are the medium here. And these are the longer ones. So as far as the uh, layout of how I do these, it does come with an instruction sheet where I write all this out. But basically, we're going to start with our five largest petals. And I'm going to shape them into a star shape here, making sure the lines are all pointing outwards. And I'm going to put them fairly close together, almost touching in the center. Go a little bit farther out. Okay, so I'm just going to heat and attach these on. So you can attach them one by one if you want to, or you can kind of press down into the center. I'm just going to use this as a guide to kind of lift up each petal. Let's go ahead and heat that one a little bit more. Just to give myself a visual. Um, with odd numbers like this, the easiest way that I remember as far as where to place them is that no two should be directly across from each other. And then, of course, even numbers is going to be the opposite of that. They are going to be across from each other. So see how I'm just sliding them underneath the disc for that first layer so they're nice and open. And then I'm going to use my fan and cool these in place. So they are still a little warm. If you do them all at once and you're kind of quick about it once you get some practice, you can do them all at once so that they're all a little bit flexible and I can move them around if I want to. So I'm just going to cool this down so they're in their place that they want once I have them all kind of spaced evenly. And then I'll add my next layer on. So I'm letting these fall down a little bit so that they're not completely curved. I want lots of space in the center. I know it's hard to see from right above, but I'll hold this up on its side too once it is uh, cool and put together so you can see the depth that it has. Yeah. All right. So I'm just making sure these all feel pretty good. This guy's still a little bit viable, but sometimes too, if you want to put the whole thing together while it's a little warm, it does help because then you can move all of the petals. You can always reheat a petal with the torch and then move it around if you needed to, but you can see my base to start with here. Okay. So then my next layer of petals, uh, where I cut just a little bit off the ends, those are going to go in between each of the previous petals. So I'm putting them right in between each. And instead of going underneath the disc, I'm going to go right next to it. So I'm kind of going to go up to that disc. And I'm going to heat, not while holding it. That's a very bad example. So I'm going to set it down, keep the end a little bit, and then just press that right up against. Okay. Oh, that is so cool. How does anyone not want to have a go at that? Right? It's so much fun. I, I just imagine normal 12-year-old girls playing with the Barbie and there's Sydney 
gilding her isomalt sculptures at the age of 12. <laughs> How on earth did you start? Um, I started in cake decorating. It was just a hobby. I had already, always wanted to do it. And then, um, I mean, on TV, I always loved watching the shows like at Christmas. They would show making the candy canes and all the hard candies and things like that on TV. And uh, I also always loved blown glass and stained glass and things like that when I was a kid. So it just really, really, when I saw that there was a way to do those kind of techniques and sugar, I was just so excited. That was it. <laughs> Okay, so see how I just put my next layer together. I'm going to cool those with my fan. I don't want to use cold spray uh, because cold spray, like freeze spray that you use for chocolate, will shatter isomalt. Isomalt is very similar to glass in the way that it will crack if it goes through extreme temperature changes. So that's why I just use my little fan here. And um, these are really easy to find. They're just, you can get them on Amazon here. This is actually um, like a hurricane preparedness fan. We have a lot of those here in Florida. So. I'm just going to cool that down. Okay. And I'm just lifting it in between each to make sure that it's not sticking to the mat or anything. But there is my next layer of petals. So you see it's just building the whole thing up. Okay, And now we're going to add on our center before we put our last layer on to cover that center disc. So I'm going to set my center down in the center by just heating up and attaching. Okay, and then this last layer of petals, the shortest and smallest petals, are going to go right up against that center. So they're actually going on top of the disc, still going in between. So they are going to be in the same spot as our very first layer of petals. They're going to be mirroring those, and they're going to cut pretty close around the base um, or around the top of the center. So I'm just going to attach it. Sometimes I'll put little props like pieces of foil or something um, or little silicone molds or you know anything that I can put in between to make sure that they don't fall down if you did overheat a little bit and they weren't cooling very quickly. You can cool one by one too if you wanted to and just make sure that the last petal that you did is in place before you attach the next one on. But like I said I like to kind of attach them all at once so I can move them around and make sure that they're all going to be even. And then our last one. All right. Well, so I will just glue this down a little bit here before I pick it up. And now you'll notice that this whole thing is done in pearl, right? It's done in white, even though generally water lilies and lotuses are going to have colors to them. So we are going to be painting this afterwards. So I'm going to show you a little bit of airbrushing on my finished piece. Asimalt takes airbrushing beautifully. But what I like to do is usually just use a base color. It's kind of the same thing as how if you're making gum paste flowers, you would start with a base color and then dust different colors on top to add depth and shading. Plus, it's going to be a lot faster than hand painting with the airbrush as well. So that is what I'm going to do in a little bit so it won't look quite so washed out with my lights here. All right. And you can see how fast this went together. So I'm going to pick it up. And there is, let me block the light a little bit, our finished water lily. Okay, so it's all completely cool and hard now. This is ready if I wanted to add a little bit of paint. Or if you did these in the colors, like the petals are pink, uh, when you poured them and the center was yellow, it's done. It can go right on your cake. And it is you know, super, super fast. There's no drying time, essentially. I mean, this took, what, maybe 15 minutes total to completely dry all the petals and it is done. Yay. Okay. So I'm going to set this guy off to the side, let him just cool down the rest of the way, make sure that there's no warmth left to him. Move my petals out of the way too. Okay. So while our other pieces are finished, are finishing up cooling and while that guy is waiting to be painted, I'm going to show you a couple of hand sculpted um, pieces for this. So I'm going to be making some grasses and some hand sculpted cattails as well. So I have one here to show you guys a little cat. Oh, look. wow. And we're going to do some little grasses as well to kind of put behind them just to add some more movement and life. Okay, so I'm going to pop the ice malt into the microwave, the green here. And then I have a heat lamp set up next to me. So I'm just going to, I put some stuff under it move it out of the way while I talk to you guys. So the heat lamp that I'm going to be using is a 250 watt bulb. So it's very, very warm and it will keep the ice malt warm there as long as you use it. So the hood that I use is like for chickens and reptiles. It's um, just a kind of hood for a lamp, a heat lamp. You have to make sure that it's braided to the right wattage of lamp. But I just turned it on here 
And then I have a YouTube video on the kind of stand that I hang it because I just built one out of PVC. You can see the edge here. Um, it's just built out of like plumbing pipe because it's food safe and it's super inexpensive and easy. But you can just clip it to your overhead cabinet as well. And uh, that will work perfect. So that will keep the ice melt warm. Now, it's not completely necessary to work under a heat lamp if you're just making pieces one by one. So if you don't have one, it's not a big deal. You can just heat your ice melt and pull it, make whatever you're going to make, and then you'll just have to keep reheating your ice melt in the microwave. But if you're going to be making a lot of pieces or, you know, time is, um, you know, a little bit short, it's nice to have the lamp there because you can pull the ice melt and just put it underneath the lamp and it will stay warm. <laughs> So I melted my ice melt back down to a liquid. I didn't quite get it to boiling because I'm going to mix more air in this anyway in a second. So I don't have to worry about those bubbles getting away. I am going to use a different silicone mat to actually pull my ice melt on. So I'm going to be using this thin silicone baking mat. So this is a silicone mat, just like or a silicone mat, just like the silpat here, but it's a little bit thinner. It doesn't have that woven texture or that slip finish. It has a little bit softer finish, and I find the ice melt releases off of this a lot easier. So that's what I like to use to pull the ice melt. Okay. So because this is silicone, I don't need to grease it or powder it or anything. I am leaving this other silicone mat underneath because I'm working on a metal table, and metal conducts heat, and I don't want to insulate too much heat. But pretty much on any surface, I recommend having another mat underneath you because it helps ice melt to cool faster and uh, release easier from this mat on top. Okay. And it also will do the opposite if you're working on like a stone, a granite countertop, something like that. Uh, it can be too cold for the ice melt. So having that other mat underneath can actually keep it a little bit warmer. So I just like to have that double mat. And you see how I poured the ice melt out onto my mat here. And I'm going to start cooling it down by folding it. Okay, so I fold over the mat and then slowly peel it back. So just like when we were pouring, the cooler this gets, the thicker and harder it gets. So we're going to actually do that on purpose now. We're going to evenly cool this. And eventually, once it's cool enough, it will start reacting like dough. It'll all come together into a ball, and it will stop sticking to the mat. So I'm just folding it completely in half, lightly tapping to make sure it's all stuck together. Remember to be wearing your gloves for this part because it is still very, very hot. Okay. When I'm folding over, I'm alternating directions, so I'm not just going one way every single time. I'm going from different angles to keep it nice and consistent. And when I'm folding it over, I am making sure that one edge is lining up with the opposite edge, so I'm not going past that or stopping before it because it will spread out a little too much. You want to keep this as condensed and warm as possible as you cool it down, if that makes sense. All right. We don't want this to cool down too fast because then it will just be a cool plate. <laughs> you won't be able to bend it or stretch it. So that's why alternating different sides is going to heat it nice and evenly. So you can already see that the edges are starting to thicken and kind of hold their shape a little bit. That's good. And I know this is ready when it stops sticking. So I'm just going to keep folding it. I am going to move this over because even on top of this mat, it still does get quite hot underneath the mat. So I'm going to move it to a cool spot every few folds on the table. And that's just going to help to keep the whole thing nice and cool. Silicone has pores just like skin. So what can happen is if you insulate too much heat in one spot, it can actually open up the pores too much and the ice melt can get stuck down in it. And that's what causes your ice melt to stick to the mat. That's totally fine if it happens because you can just, once you're ready, you can remove the excess ice melt off and still use that. And that one little spot that's stuck, you can just rinse in cool water and it literally jumps off. It very rarely will stick in the same spot twice. It really is just about if you had a hot spot from the table or from the microwave, sometimes it can stick, but that really does help to have that extra mat underneath and to keep moving it around. Okay. So I wonder if you're at home like me, I'm watching this. I've never seen this before. I think this is like watching magic and I have to keep remembering to close my mouth a little bit. <laughs> it really is. I mean, it comes together so quickly and ice is just so unique. It's so different from anything else. And that's why I love it. Okay, so you see how now it's all kind of coming together into more of a dough. I can see that it is still quite hot. It's still sticking to the mat. But now that it's out of what I call the splatter zone, it's not going to splatter like a liquid on anything. I can go a little bit faster, and that will help it to cool and release. So I'm holding the side of the mat and holding this mat here and releasing quick. And you see how it's just coming right off. And so it does not feel sticky to the mat anymore, and it's just kind of hanging out and sitting there. Then I can pick it up. Okay, there we go. 
So you can see how it's not sticking like it was before, but it is still quite hot. If I sculpted anything into it, it's just going to blob back down and not hold any shape. Um, it is still very, very warm, so I still recommend the gloves. It's going to be about 150 degrees or so Fahrenheit at this point. So it's about half the temperature of the liquid, but it is still hot and can be quite uncomfortable. So go ahead and wear your gloves, and then you can just start stretching and folding some cool air into this. This is the same thing as what we were just doing on the mat. We're folding in cool air to cool this whole thing down a little more and make the texture firmer so that it holds its shape once we start sculpting. So I'm just stretching. This is where the name pulled sugar comes from. I'm just pulling in air. I'm making sure that those lines and those streaks that I'm getting with all that air I'm folding in are just going one way. I'm not twisting this up or kneading it like you would fondant and gum paste. I'm just keeping this as consistent as possible so it doesn't get thin and thick spots. I'm just folding it over and I like to roll it as well and just cool off the surface until it's a texture that I like. And it really just takes a little bit of practice to know that. Um, I smell it's a very hands-on texture, so I can tell you about it all day, but once you actually feel it, it's very easy to tell, just like if you've been working with fondant and gum paste and modeling chocolate, um, you can tell when those are ready, when you've kneaded it enough and it's a good texture. With this, it's kind of a practice, I mean, in between, again, we want it to be cool enough and uh, firm enough that it's going to hold its shape, but not so hard and so cool that it's just a rock. We still want some pliability to be able to sculpt with it. So I think it's just about there because I can see it's holding its shape. It's not just immediately turning into a blob, but it is still quite viable and I'm going to be able to sculpt with it. If you did a YouTube video of just this, I would subscribe. <laughs> That's so satisfying. Yeah, I do have a YouTube uh, channel of all the ice melt basics. So ice melt pulling is on there and things like that. Um, just to get I would just watch you roll in it and roll in it and be very, very comfortable and happy. Exactly. Yeah, it's mesmerizing. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to start making uh, my cattail first. I'm going to cut a piece off here and put my excess underneath the lamp to keep it warm. And then I'm just going to start stretching this. The key with pulled ice malt is going to be not to overwork it because unlike fondant and gum paste, where with those, the more you touch it, the more you knead it, the softer and more pliable will be. With this, the more that you touch it and the more you add air into it, it's going to get cooler and harder. So it's very important not to overwork the ice malt until you're ready for it to cool. So I'm just stretching out and rolling a little tube here. That's gonna be the stem for my cattail. There we go. This excess piece, I've now cooled it a lot by stretching it and touching it and rolling it. So I don't wanna put it back underneath the lamp. I wanna make sure that this is going to melt back down to a liquid. Otherwise, the lamp is really good for keeping things warm that are already warm, but it's not going to be great for reheating things that have cooled down. So this is going to just go right into my bowl. So it's going to go right back into the bowl and get remelted to liquid so it's all nice and even. Okay, so see how now I'm rolling because I am ready for it to cool off. So I'm purposely touching it. I'm purposely rolling it into the cooler mat, and that's just going to solidify the whole thing. See, I just pulled it to a slight taper at one end, so it's a little bit thinner, but not very much. And this is going to be our stem. So you can put a wire in these if you wanted to. Instead of rolling a tube, I would roll a tube, but then I'd flatten it um, while it's still pretty uh, thick. And I would use a rolling pin to flatten it and then just kind of almost sushi roll the wire inside to add a little bit of stability. But these aren't very big, so I'm not going to worry about having support. I small is fairly strong. Since this isn't going anywhere, um, it's just going to be a display piece. It doesn't really need too much more support. But if you were delivering it, you absolutely could put a wire or something on it. And then I'm just going to let that cool. So I rolled it enough that it's not going to just flatten on one side. It's pretty cool now. And then I just kind of bent it slightly and I'll let it cool in that shape to hold its shape as kind of some movement like the wind is blowing through it. Okay. So now I'm just going to cut off another piece and do that very similar thing. But I'm going to make it a little bit thicker here for the top of my cattail. So I'm not going to stretch it out too much. I'm pretty much just going to leave it just like that. And then because this is thicker, I'm going to use my little fan as I roll just to speed it up for time's sake. You don't have to do this, but for demonstration purposes, it'll just make it go a little faster. And I'm just going to cool that off. And so the same thing as the water lily, you'll see I'm making this in a base color and then I'll be painting on top of it later with some edible paints. And I like to do that not just for time's sake and for not having to pull a whole bunch of different colors of ice mold, but also just because it keeps your color palette the same. So even though in these final pieces, you can't really see the green that's underneath this brown paint, 
it's still, if it hits the light right, you're going to see a little bit of that undertone because this is see-through and it's just going to pull your whole color palette together. So I like using a base color of very, very similar colors or as few amount of colors as I can in all of my base pieces and then painting on top because it just kind of keeps your color family the same, if that makes sense. Okay. So that should be perfect. And then I will make a little point that's going to go on top of the cattail. Okay, so I just cut off a little teeny tiny little piece, just like that. And I can roll it a little, but that's probably all it needs. And I will heat and stick that to the top. So there's my little stem that's going to go on top of my cattail. And then to attach these two together, I'm just going to do the same thing. I'm going to heat and stick. And that's really it. You see how fast pieces go together. It makes them super, super easy. This is still a little pliable, so I'll let it cool off to the side while we make our other pieces. But it really is that easy. That. So while that guy cools, I'm going to show you some grass pieces. So I'm going to use actually the whole piece of ice melt that I pulled now. Generally, I would do this under the light, but for lighting issues, I'm not going to um, move you guys over. I'm just going to do it right here. Um, but this works best if you're under the lamp to keep this all nice and warm. So what I'm going to do is just fold it over so I have a nice smooth spot here with very few wrinkles. And I'm going to pinch it. So I'm pinching a little flat spot and pulling it out and downwards a little bit and then pulling up. And this is gonna start flattening. If I was to hand sculpt the water lily and do it by hand instead of using a mold, I would do it this way. So I'd stretch out my petals or my leaves in this case. So once I have it the width I want, I'm just stretching it. And then I'm gonna pull, 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 pull. And then I'm cutting this at an angle so that it comes to a point, kind of like a flower stem. I'll fold the excess back in and put it under my lamp. And then you could leave it like this, but I like to put a little center vein down the middle just to add a little bit more texture to it and add some interest. Oh, I love that. Love that. That's this is so cool. So I just put a little bit of movement in it and that is it. It will be cool in about a minute or two and it's ready to go right on your cake. And it has that really cool translucent effect as well. Okay. Perfect. So you can, again, make the uh, petals like this. At this point, you can imprint or when this was still warm enough you could imprint it onto an impression mat if you wanted to like a silicone vader um it just makes it so so easy to make these by hand if you didn't have the mold as well of course the mold is going to take some of the guesswork out of it because they're all perfect in the same shape every single time but there's definitely a beauty to having it a little more natural as well and having the edges less perfect okay all right so uh, i think i have all of my different pulled pieces i'm going to unplug the lamp so that you guys' this light goes a little bit back to normal here. And I'm going to start unmolding all of my different faces and things. So my uh, water really should be done. I'm just going to grab a tool, make sure that's cool before I stick my finger on it. And there is our beautiful water lily leaf. It has a little bit of cloudiness just from the mold. Sometimes silicone molds can collect a little bit of uh, bubbles on the surface. So I'm just gonna go very low and just lightly hit this. I'm not clearing away all the bubbles because when we glaze this, it will shine up. But you see how that just kind of reflected the light really beautifully and melted a little bit on the surface. Okay. Same thing with our dragonflies. Oh, I forgot about that. They pretty. Gorgeous. And I can see on these guys, the edges, a little bit easier how kind of in between some of the wings, they're not quite perfect and they got some rough edges on them. So that's where I'll take and melt with my torch face down so I don't get any of the detail on the front melted and I'll put this pretty low. And I'm just lightly, lightly tracing and then I'll let these pull all the way before I move them since I'm not bending them like I did with the petals. Okay, and finally our base is all cool. So I'm just going to Peel them out away. And there is our finished base. So I can see those little bubbles. I actually really don't mind those because it looks like water. It adds that kind of depth that you didn't even have to do anything to. So a lot of times I'll leave it, but there is a little bit of a texture underneath here from the mat because the mat has a slight woven texture. So if I wanted to get rid of that, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to melt the underneath. 
So I'm going to take my torch. I'll turn it up a little bit so it goes faster. And I'm just going to heat. And that'll melt the bubbles as well. I'm just going to heat a section and pick it up so you guys can see the difference. This is where it was. And then this is once you torch it. So it really does make a difference. Just clearing away some of those bubbles. I'll leave a few of the bigger bubbles in because I like that depth in it. Okay. okay, so I'll let that cool just a little bit and we will start assembling. So I have my dragonflies here. Flip this guy over. Okay, so I always want to make sure that I know where I want things before I put them together with ice melt because once it's stuck, it is stuck. So I'm just going to kind of pre plan a little bit. Put some of my grass is behind it over there. And I'm just going to um, heat and stick these. So I'm going to heat a little bit on the base. Sometimes I'll use a uh, liquid ice mold as glue, depending on how your pieces are going to be sitting. These have a pretty low center of gravity. There's nothing really, I mean, the cattail's a little bit, but there's nothing too uh, top heavy or gravity defying about this piece. So I don't need too much extra glue. But if you wanted to, you could just use liquid ice mold as a glue instead. Okay, so just heating and attaching this right down on. Okay, and I can see, I mean, I'm holding it by the water lily and it's really, really stuck on there. So it's gonna be super strong. Okay, I'm gonna take a couple of these guys and have them kind of sticking out. There's the back here. And I'm gonna prop them up with some grasses as well. So I'm just torching, kind of sticking. I'm going to stick them to the water lily whenever possible as well. So these are touching the petal as well as touching the base. So if I wanted to, I can go kind of down between and just zap it so that they stick together as well as sticking to the base. That just adds another attachment point. And then I'm going to cool some of these down. Make sure it's all going to set up nicely. Another one here. And from here, it's just about kind of placement and balance and making sure that they all match in together. I know it's kind of hard to see from the top, but I promise I will hold this up in a second so you guys can see. Maybe I'll put a couple more pieces of grass around here. Okay, let's find a big piece of grass here. So like that. Put one more. These are very, very lightweight, so it doesn't take very much to attach them on. So there is our grass is attached onto the back. And then we have our little dragonflies to attach on here. So just as a general rule, usually bigger, um, kind of heavier pieces are going to go towards the bottom. And then lighter weight pieces are going to go towards the top here. So I'm just going to attach one of my dragonflies towards the bottom. And then one of them is going to go balance up. So I'm going to kind of put it so that it's touching two of my petals here. Just like that. And because this is so lightweight, you can really kind of balance it on the top. And it's also kind of touching its tail onto this back petal here as well. Okay, so this is the beginning of our piece here all put together. And now the very last touch that I'm going to do is I'm going to airbrush a little bit onto the water lily itself just to make it everything pop so that it has some really beautiful depth. So I'm just gonna grab a couple paper towels here to cover up around just so I don't get airbrush everywhere. Airbrushing is a really, really, really amazing painting tool. I absolutely love airbrushing, especially with ice malt. Now I did glaze these, um, so I'm gonna just lightly torch 
over my petals to burn off the glaze. Since I pre-made these so that you guys wouldn't have to wait while I made every single one. I'm just gonna not catch these paper towels on fire. <laughs> Grab my airbrush here. So I'm just using a nice small little airbrush and some water-based airbrush colors. So I'll start off with my yellow for the center. Add a couple drops. Always test it off to the side. The key with painting on ice melts is to use light layers. I'm doing this to get jiggling. Is to use very light layers because ice melts not like fondant and gum paste that absorbs. It's just going to sit on the surface. So you don't want to do too much because then it can beat up very quickly. So do a light coat and then let it dry. And then do another light coat if you want to build it up more and let it dry. So I'm just letting it overlap a little bit onto the petals just to add more of a natural look. Just a little bit here. Sydney, you mentioned the glaze a little bit. Why would you use the glaze? Yeah, how so the edible glaze is going to go on at the very end. So after we finish painting, I spray over it with this clear edible glaze spray. And that is going to lock out moisture and keep it from getting sticky or cloudy. So it's going to make it really, really nice because if you're in a humid area like I am, it's just going to make sure that it locks out the moisture and it doesn't get sticky or cloudy from humidity like ice melt is known to do. So that is just my final step whenever I make an ice melt piece. And it's just going to really lock out um, all the moisture and it can stay nice and shiny like this for days, weeks, even for months. So I'm just going to kind of airbrush a little bit on the edges of my petals here. So when you talked about your petals that you'd done in advance, had you glazed those to protect them whilst yeah. they were be assembled? But then yeah. you thought to take the glaze away before Correct. you went, is that what you did, right? I, that's what I did just because I wanted to pre-make pieces. Now, if you're in your kitchen and you're just making this whole thing at once, you don't have to glaze them until after you're done painting and you're completely finished with your piece. So after I'm done painting and it's all completely done, I would glaze it. Not only will that lock out the moisture, but it'll lock in the paint so that your paint will actually stay on. It won't smudge and it won't come off on your fingers as you're touching it and moving it around. All right. So I think that's about good. Sometimes depending on what you're doing with it and what you like, you can go back after this dries a little bit and add a little bit more um, dimension if you wanted to. Add some more depth to the colors or add in different colors, but I will go ahead and hold this up. So this is the point. I would move it away. I would completely, completely cover everything because the glaze doesn't like to come off the surfaces, especially silicones and things like that. So I just put like a piece of plastic down or a plastic tablecloth or something and um, spray this onto my finished piece. And there you have your finished water lily sculpture. Oh, except I just pushed a little dragonfly off here. There we go. Finished water lily yeah, sculpture. Thank you. I know it's only me, but just pretend that this is the whole of India and beyond. Simply yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. you are the undisputed queen of isomalt. And oh, I you. can't believe how much we've just learned. We've learned about molds and pulling and colouring. And I just am so, this is the best hour I've spent in a long time. And I, I think it's some really cool. exciting stuff, I tell you. I have absolutely <laughs> loved that. And I think that of the Cakeology audience would do too. Sydney Galpin, thank you so much. We love you and hopefully we'll see you in India one day. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so, so much, Rose. Thank you to Cakeology. I had such a fun time and this is such an awesome event. I'm so honored to be a part of it. Thank you to everybody who's watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Well, we hope you've enjoyed staying with us today. We've still got some more for you, including the announcement of our Best in Show competition winner. We're going to go over to Knitting for another little bit of baked laughs. We want to leave you smiling today. Uh, before that, let's go quickly over to our wheel and find out who is going to be our last lucky draw winner of the day. <laughs>
Just look at all those names. Will it be you? This is the last chance for our lucky draw winner. Where's it going to start? Is it you? It's Mrs. Rajani Harish Kewat. Put your hand up. You are our last winner of the day. Congratulations. Yay! <laughs> Hi guys, this is Nitin Milani and I am back. As you can see, I still look the same. I have the same hat. I have the same clothes because I don't have any money and I've not done any shopping during this quarantine. Uh, so this is an amazing, amazing thing right now. I want to actually welcome all of you guys. Let me give you a round of applause first. Let's clap for you guys. You are actually part of the first baked laughs. We're going to have baked laughs. You're actually part of the first session. How does it feel? So tell you a little bit about Dubai. What I love about Dubai is that comedy writes itself. You know? That's the best thing. I'll tell you how jokes happen on, on their own. Uh, true story, uh, around six years back, Salman Khan was invited to Dubai. Uh, specially invited. Do you, do, you know, do you guys know why he was invited? Great, I'll tell you. To inaugurate a driving school. Right? And you, and you can Google this. This is actually a true story. Uh, Salman didn't come. He sent the driver. Because that's how things are, unfortunately. And you know, I'm just saying, uh, you know, nowadays when I'm watching these Bollywood movies, uh, I don't know why, you know, now because of Netflix, all the voiceovers are done by British people and Gora people. Like we have such amazing voiceover artists who speak in Hindi. I don't know why we have to outsource that also. Like, you know, and it sounds so wrong. You know, you've got a, you've got a voiceover which comes like, Salman Khan, Akshay Kumar. Katrina Kaif, Karina Kapu, in Asman Ko Chuna Hai. What the hell is Asman Ko Chuna Hai? It's Asman Ko Chuna Hai. That's the wrong kind of movie. And that's never going to release. Right? But one of the, one of the best things about Mumbai is, you know, when I moved to Mumbai and I understood that Indians are so amazing that we love to complicate simple things in life. Right? Simple things. Right? And I don't know one thing, uh, being a Sindhi, I've realized whenever I meet a Sindhi, uh, an auntie, especially an auntie who's Sindhi and she finds out I'm from Dubai, there's a weird excitement she gets. Right? There's an instant connect. Like I remember I met this auntie once and she's like, Oh, beta, you're from Dubai. I'm, oh my God, I'm Sindhi. You're Sindhi. She goes, beta, if you need anything, anything you need, ghar ka khana, any support, any help, beta, just come home. Our house is your house, beta. Just come home. My only issue is they never tell you where they stay. <laughs> right? Where do we go? And I don't know what is this fascination with Mumbai is the fact that, you know, everybody wants to know where you stay. That's, that's the first question. Like after 10 minutes of talking to you, I say, where do you stay? Where, where, where do you stay? Stay where, you, where you stay? Right? But the problem is in India, they complicate it. Right? Simple questions, but now these new group of people, like I was talking to this guy, suddenly he goes, uh, so Nitin, uh, bro, where are you put up? Where am I put up? What am I a painting? Why will I be put up somewhere? Right? If somebody wants to ask me, what do I do? They goes, uh, so Nitin, uh, what's your background? It's a white curtain. How does it matter? And this is the best one. For people who want to meet you for meetings, they call you and say, uh, Nitin, how are you placed on Monday? <laughs> I'm placed in Ganpati Visarjan position. How, how does it matter? You know, I, I don't know. So so I think most of the people are either, either in a relationship or married here, right? You know, I want to know after Corona, things will change so much. Like, you know, it's going to be so weird meeting somebody new. Like, you know, it's literally going to be like how we used to be in school. That first you hold hands, then wait for 14 days. Then you kiss, then wait for 14 days. So by the time you really get to know a person, Saat Janam Khatam Ho Jayenge. I think this is what they meant by Saat Janam. And I think with Desi people, you know, I, I love how the husbands are losing it sometimes. I remember I was speaking to this guy and he was telling me that, listen, Saat Janam is okay, seven, seven births is okay, but 60 days with your wife is too much. Sometimes, you know, when you talk to people, uh, 
uh, and uh, this is I don't know if, if it is a habit that a lot of people have is when you ask them what are your hobbies and they say things like I read I like to read and write yeah. I'm like no that's what you need to do learn how to do you know that's not a hobby that's how you will survive like you know I like walking yeah <laughs> nobody says you know what's your hobby I like breathing through my nose like it's it's absolutely so weird so I I got married uh, last year. Thank you, thank you. I love, I love uh, saying this because I love the response of the women. Uh, it is completely different from the men. Like every time I tell a woman that you know uh, I'm, I got married last year, they like, like you, congratulations, so good, happy for you, take care, hashtag blessed. Matlab, oh my God, so amazing. You tell the man the same thing, he's like, good luck, huh? my condolences. <laughs> Call me if you need anything. And and the, this is the best one. I tell them, you know, I got married last year. They go like, "Acha, last year, wait for five years." I mean, what is this? The Modi government? What will change? Nothing will change in the next five years. So uh, you know, I I I remember uh, you know in my initial days uh, when I was dating, uh, I think my my main thing was that uh, I was not concerned about how a woman looks. And how my com- to be companion would look. I was not particular, but I was particular about one thing, and that one thing was, does she snore? Good point. It's a very good point, right? And the problem is, you don't know until you are already in bed with her. There's no way to find out, right? And and I remember I was dating this Australian model. She was so good looking, and then she fell asleep. I swear to God, I swear to God, she was like, you know, it was and the worst part, like, you know what I heard in the night? Suddenly I heard, ah, ah. I woke up twice because I thought there's a bus coming to hit me. Right. So I remember she, she they wake up in the morning and say, baby, was I snoring? I'm like, of course you were. You can ask the whole building. The whole of JBR knows that you were snoring. You know, and this is the best answer they give. Yeah, actually, I must be tired. Tired of what? What do you do? Do you work in a mill? Do you are you a pearl diver? Are you saving children from canyons? Why are you so tired? Like I remember, I saw the dog right now. She had a, such a cute dog called uh, Droopy, right? Because his eyes were like all Droopy. She called him Droopy. I was like, his name is not Droopy. He was a normal dog when you got him. He hasn't slept from the time you got him. He has become Droopy. Like I remember when she was snoring, there was a time where the dog and me both are looking at each other saying, Pehle tu kaatega, pehle main kaatunga, bata. <laughs> Right? That has to stop. That has to stop. And you know, it's just that, you know, I, I always say that women are far more superior than men. I believe in that. Because they are working on a different level. Right? They, they are, they are, they are, matlab, kere, chronology jo unka hai, wo alag hi hai. So men should not even bother competing. Like, like women can say anything and get out of any situation. And I'll tell you from personal experience, I want to say that men get easily confused, right? We do. We do. We already get easily confused. But why will a man not be confused when her wife, when his wife or girlfriend calls him up and says something like, Acha baby, listen, listen. Uh, where are you? Acha okay, okay. Acha listen, baby, come faster, but drive slowly. Huh? How does a man get home? But honestly speaking, I love dogs. Anybody like cats here? Yeah, I don't okay. like. Uh, can I be honest? I, I am not fond of cats at all. Cats are so selfish. You know, cats, like if you have a cat and you go home, it's like you are going to the cat's house. She's paying the rent. Right? And dogs are so amazing. Yeah, every time you meet a dog, like a dog is happy to see you. Like you can now, Priya, you can now go to the washroom and come back. He'll be like, Arey, I haven't seen you in so long. Long time no see. He'll be happy. A cat, you can leave a cat alone for six months. And when you come back home, I swear to God, the cat will just be in the corner. Looking, <laughs> sitting in a corner. Look, looking like Bipasha Basu from Jism with one leg out. And if she could talk, she would say, Ye koi time hai aane ka? That's all she gives a shit about.
I hope you're having a great time with us today. Um, I'm so excited to see again Huma and Gurnish from Fat Flavor Fragrances. Hi, guys. Hi, hi. How are, how are you, you doing, Rose? It's been a while now. Oh, it has been too long, and I'm so sad not to see you again this year, but I did meet you last year, and I tasted and smelt some of your amazing products. Tell everybody at home something about Fab and how it came about. Well, uh, Fab uh, started as a company uh, way back in the 1990s, uh, but our history goes back to 1990. So that's when we started dealing in flavors, then came manufacturing in 65, and then Fab came into being in 1992. And uh, So 100 years are done already with Fab. Okay? Yeah. We are already 100 year old company. company. And uh, with the small, for the home baker segments, we started in 2010 and then uh, slowly by 2015, we came with the premium range and we started marketing it in a big way. So that's how, that's, that's a little bit of what we do. So Rose, the thing is that I was a home baker and uh, the home bakers, I, I was learning from home, uh, you know, a lot of, we all go learning and workshops and we all go all that. So there, uh, I started meeting a lot of people who were looking for flavors and they were already using our products and uh, we were not aware because we were ourselves not uh, marketing it ourselves and we were just, you know, concentrating on industrial. So that's how in, 19, uh, in 2016, we started the, the segment for the home bakers uh, because I joined the business and we started that whole uh, line for the home baker segment. And everybody like me who came to Cakeology last year got to taste and smell some of your products, which were incredible. That's the benefit of being able to meet the home bakers, isn't it? What do you think the prospects are for home bakers um, and fab within home, the home baking industry in the future? Uh, we have been really, really uh, welcomed by the industry, uh, the home bakers here in India and abroad now. A lot of uh, bakers were settled abroad. They take their stuff from here and, you know, they are giving us very, very good reviews. Uh, see, home baker is somebody who likes quality. So, uh, prospects look pretty nice because they are appreciating the quality. We are giving them good quality product and uh, they don't mind paying a little uh, more for a good quality product. So, that's the USP right now for us. And obviously, before we came into the market, there were not really very good quality products in the market for the home bakers. So that is why, you know, when we came in, we thought that we would give them a very good quality, something that they want and which they cannot get. So, And that's why we are so proud to be um, having you as a partner for Cakeology. I didn't realize the business had been going for 100 years. Your marriage hasn't been going for 100 years, though. No, Not no. Yet. <laughs> you're, you're on the way to 100 years. Uh, Guys, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you'll stick with us for the rest of the show. We're really loving seeing all our partners and I can't wait to see you next year. show but we have got the very best bit to come we are about to announce our best in show chef nicholas are you there to announce our best in show winner chef nicholas it is so lovely to have you on board but we've got a special award as well haven't we so don't go anywhere because chef nicholas you're going to tell us about our special award but first of all can you announce our best in show winner this must have been a hard one to judge it was. I mean, the quality and standard of the competition was incredible. And, uh, you know, we were just blown away by the, uh, the number of entries, but also from all over the world. So it was a, it was a very daunting task and uh, took a long time to go through everything because we actually, you know, judged every single entry. So it was uh, very, uh, very, very excellent. And uh, yeah, so what you do, isn't it? You take so much time because you know how much time people have put into their entries. Have you got any advice for people who are going to be a little bit disappointed, maybe, that they don't get the, the result that they were after? 
Well, as I always tell my competitors, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's about the journey. It's not winning. It's about the journey getting there. And this will strengthen you as a cake artist or baker. And uh, don't be disappointed because just being part of the competition, you're a winner within all our eyes for everybody. And, and it's brilliant to see all, all the entries. Um, do you have an absolute favorite yourself? And did you agree? Did the judges agree? Uh, we did actually, we agreed. And obviously we were, as a jury, you know, we obviously collaborated on things. And obviously we're very, very excited about these, uh, this, uh, the best to show. And then another very special award that we're going to be giving. Our secret, our little secret. So nobody has to, don't go anywhere. because <laughs> we, we are not finishing with the best in show. We do have something very special for you. But first of all, I need to, can I give you a drum roll, Nicholas? Of course, of course. <laughs> our best in show. This is our first ever virtual cake competition for Cakeology. Such a shame that we're not doing this in person. But, you know, in a way, this is maybe a little bit better because so many more people can get to be part of this, can't they, Nick? Exactly. And this was also a non-drama show. You know, you didn't have to worry about getting it to Mumbai and yeah. with the roads and potholes and things and all the other things we see in India. So this was, yeah. I'm sure, yeah. a lot I'll less be... stressful. We're, we're scared of the traffic in Mumbai, if I'm honest. That's true, isn't it? And I will miss it and I miss everybody else. But for this year and this year alone at the moment, who is our da -da 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 best in show? So the best of show is going to go to Sylvia Janowski. And it was an incredible, it was cookies, these adorable frog cookies. I mean, and it got perfect score. I mean, it was so, so amazing. I mean, just the, the not only the detail in the cookies, but the presentation as well. So congratulations to Sylvia. You did an incredible job. <laughs> So Sylvia is currently jumping up and down in front of her screen. We hope congratulations, hope so. <laughs> Sylvia. A very, very popular entry. So I hope everybody will be on board with that as a choice. But difficult, still difficult, but well done, Sylvia. Um, and now, Chef Nicholas, you are about to announce a very special award. Yes, so this is really the first time this has ever happened in a show I judged, but we had obviously the tops in the top uh, winners in each category were then put into obviously best of show and uh, Sylvia got basically the perfect score. So she actually won that by uh, being the highest scorer in each of the categories, which is normal in a cake show. But there was one piece in the decorative exhibits that just exemplified what we're all going through at the moment with COVID-19 globally. And really the main reason why this is an online show is because we can't all be together in India, sadly. And um, so as head judge, I sort of made a decision and asked the other judges, are you comfortable with this? So we are actually going to give a special award for the most emotionally reflective entry um, based on obviously the global pandemic that we're in. And that goes to Sabrina Latif. <laughs> So Sabrina, it was a... she would not have expected this at all. So this is a bonus. This is an extra special yes. prize. But Sabrina's yes. award is basically for raising all our emotions with yes. the cake entry. Yes. And it was, I mean, it's just that, you know, very few times in my career have I ever had a piece that is very emotionally, you know, there a few years ago after 9-11, Benny Rivera did a firefighter in New York. And that, that stands in my mind. And this is the same. It just sort of, you know, as I said, exemplified what the whole global situation, not just India, but everywhere. And the reason why we couldn't be all together was because of COVID. And this is just a, and the health workers and obviously people that have uh, kept us safe uh, during this time. So we felt it was just a wonderful um, honor to give that to Sylvia. So, so well done, Sil Sil Sabrina. Well Sabrina, done, Sabrina. Sabrina. Well done, Sylvia, as well, of course. Yes, and, from and us, Sabrina. We say a big goodbye Nick. I'm gonna cry now like you're getting me emotional I know. now. I know it is. I am so so sad that we won't be meeting definitely but that we won't be having Chef Nicholas along to Cakeology this year and myself so disappointed but thrilled that you've joined us today. We've had such a great day. Did you enjoy knitting and his comedy? 
I, I, I tell you, we have not expected to have so much fun today, but we have. And for those of you who have been struggling, we are here and we miss you and we hope that you will stay with it. For those of you who have just missed Cakeology, hang in there, we'll be back in 2021. And for, for all of us, from, from all the judges as well, Nick, you can say that yes. on their behalf, can't you? Um, yes. We've had an amazing day. We miss you all until 2021. Goodbye from me, from Chef Nicholas, and from all of us at Cakeology 2020.